and welcome to a very special shorts compilation of The Cinephiles. I'm Steve Morris. I'm a filmmaker, directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is John Rook. I'm a writer, producer, actor, and host here in San Diego, California. I say actor because people don't know that I'm a SAG actor, Steve, and right now we're on strike. I'm doing our show, but I'm on strike in other places, just letting you know. Well, I had this multi-million dollar deal I was going to offer you to star in, but I guess if you're on strike, I guess I'll just have to put that away. Well, we can talk about it off. off, off, <laughs> off, off, off. <laughs> um, before we, first of all, we have an incredible lineup of some of our shorts to share with yeah. you. But before we do that, John, yes. you have just come from a place that I have not gone to in many years, oh. but is something real special. And that is San Diego Comic-Con. How is it this year? Yeah, I went for the first time today, which is Thursday as we're recording this. And I went for a few hours and walked the floor and, you know, got that Comic-Con vibe and feeling. And there were some nice things to see. I took a couple of pictures of myself in front of certain thing, certain uh, displays. But man, um, even though the big studios are not there with all their big stuff, it's still just packed with people. And I guess all these years with, you know, comic with uh, COVID and everything else, like being around a big, a large amount of people in a confined space, I think is not something that I can do anymore, but it was great to kind of, you know, see other, see the kids dressed up, see the people in their cosplay outfits and what have you. But yeah, Steve, it's, uh, it takes a lot out of you and I'm exhausted uh, as we're recording this from that four hour experience. Uh, on the floor. Well, and it's got to be, did it look different considering with the strike and everything, mm -hmm. all of there, it's not going to be the same this year because some of those big panels and publicity yeah. stuff, that's not happening. Oh, Hall H is a ghost town. I mean, today they had the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles panel, which I couldn't get, I couldn't get down in time to get into, um, but Michael and uh, Shannon on the Geek Buddies did. And, uh, you know, that's pretty much it. As I look at the schedule for the next few days, that is really the only panel um, that I would, uh, say, uh, that I would have attended to be honest with you. So, yeah. So, um, I, yeah, it's weird. It's weird to have hall H be a place that I'm not going and all the other panels, I guess, are more of the panels that I would kind of default to if I couldn't get into the bigger ones. So it's kind of weird for those to now be front and center. If I was to go and and go to a few of these panels over the next few days. No, I mean, it, it is a sign of the huge changes that are going on in our industry. And in fact, the first short that we're going to share with you, and these, of course, are the cinephile shorts that we put out every single week. They vary from 10 to 15 minutes to an hour yeah. long, yeah, yeah, yeah. depending on the topic. And the first one relates to this is close to an hour long. And that's our discussion of the WGA and sag after strikes. Yeah, yeah. We just recorded that one earlier. I think this week or last week, that all the days are slamming into themselves. So uh, for those of us, for those of you who are not our $5 and above uh, patrons, this is a sample, a large sample of what you can get for being a $5 and above patron and uh, what you get in, in additional content here. And Steve and I endeavor to do 10 to 15 minutes on a topic, but when something, <laughs> something big like this pops up, I think we just kind of let ourselves go for a little bit and, and really try to cover everything around that topic. So you all enjoy a comprehensive discussion about an, an important issue. Well, and this is the thing is that, you know, obviously for the show, we have a very specific format and it's mm -hmm. deep dive into movies, but John and I, in addition to being old friends, have a lot to say about a lot of topics. And so the shorts are a great way for us yeah. to have different kinds of conversations. And that's why we think, you know, signing up particularly for that $5 and above level is such a sweet spot yeah. because in addition to getting to listen to the shorts, you also get ad free versions of the show. And you also get to hear some of these other conversations. For instance, we frequently review big movies if we've both seen them. So yeah. uh, we, well, the second topic you're going to hear on the shorts today is our discussion of Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Yeah, which I think is always a lot of fun when when uh, Steve's like, I'd like to, I want to discuss this, or uh, one of you, one of your family, or I go to Steve and be like, Hey, man, we should talk about this movie. Or if one of you all who are listening to us right now suggests something on social media, or reach out to us on DM or on Facebook message, um, sometimes we take your suggestions under advisement and uh, and do it. And Dial of Destiny was one of these films that a lot of you wanted us to talk about, so we did. And I thought it was a fun discussion. 
It was a great discussion, it, and that's one of our other tiers at Patreon, which is at the ten dollars above mm-hmm. level. You get to be one of the people that suggests the short topics. You also get to submit early questions for things like our live shows and our episodes. And when we put out those multi-part, two or three-part episodes, you get access to a combined episode, seven hours long for your listening pleasure. And all of these can exist. Patreon sets it up so that you can create a podcast feed that not only has the regular show, the ad-free versions, the combined versions, but also has all these shorts in it. Uh, And that's something great for all of you to check out. Yeah. For sure. Um, and then our next, because <laughs> sometimes the reason that we get together to have these conversations is because we're basically scared shitless. And the next <laughs> yeah. thing you're going to hear on this shorts compilation is a is a short titled AI Be Very Afraid, because frankly, we are. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly it's an interesting time for us to put this out, because obviously, just like we were saying on that particular short, whatever we're talking about in that moment about AI is already out of date with how AI, quickly AI is advancing. Google just did a presentation of how much more they've advanced on their AI technology. And just this week, a, a, magazine, a magazine publisher issued an entire issue of a magazine that was completely AI. Every picture was AI generated. Every article was AI written. So that's the first shot across the bow that this can even affect the magazine industry and apparently the if the google presentation showed that they could that the ai is now is possibly capable of writing news articles for you about current news things that are happening so even those people might be out of jobs as well so the conversation we have i think kind of highlights how quickly this thing is moving and how unstoppable and overwhelming it all feels. No, I, this is talk about a brave new world. We yeah. literally, I, I think we literally have no idea what the world looks like five years from now. I, I think it's just going to be something. Yeah. Else. And my greatest fear is that millions and millions of people are out of jobs because of this while tech, while uh, businesses profit from it. But in the end, uh, millions of people with nothing to do, Steve, turn on the things that are making it clear that they have nothing to do and feel devalued by. And that's my greatest fear about AI is it leads to a global revolution, which yep. could be terrible for all of well, us. And fueled fueled by everything you say said and fueled by all sorts of fake news and all yes. sorts of stuff like that, that AI also could be responsible for. So yeah. very scary. And because we have <laughs> frightened you, we wanted to give you something that was a little more fun for the end. And that is something we've been doing on our Cinephile Shorts maybe once a month or so, which is a FMK, which for those of you in the know is Fuck, Mary Kill. And that is our uh, patrons can suggest ways essentially to torture us to yes. have us make horrible decisions where we either have to marry a movie that we hate or destroy a movie or a character or something that we absolutely love it has been really hard and some of the most fun conversations we've had on cinephile shorts or have one night a one night stand with these characters or these absolutely movies. So, yeah absolutely so but yeah i mean we torture well not i won't say torture but we um we subject you to our thoughts on the ending of the world or the things we're concerned about. Uh, and then you all return the favor with FMK by putting Steve and I through the <laughs> ringer, uh, trying to figure out what films we would kill. Cause I think that's the big thing, the marrying or the sex with them. That's fine. But it's the killing that really gets uh, to both of us because uh, we love films so much, which is why we do the cinephile. So having to get rid of one or a, mo- a character or a, or a director or actor, it uh, it can be quite a lot for us to consider and uh, ponder for sure. So you get us back in spades by doing that. Well, and this is also why we wanted to highlight why we think it's such a good deal to join our Patreon, because you get all of these things. You get weekly shorts, and I just you know looking at some of the ones you you'll have access to all of these yeah. five years of shorts. They're probably close to two hundred of them, and they've been everything but like. Movie reviews like we talked about, like a review of Across the Spider-Verse or Air, delving more deeply into a particular filmmaker like Robert Rodriguez. We talk about our own work, my work as a writer-director, John's work interviewing people as a voiceover actor. Like we've gone into our discussions of Westerns, of of philosophy, of music videos, of nudity in film. We've talked about the job of the AD. We've talked about Star Trek and the Borg. We've talked about (laughs) all sorts of topics, most of them suggested by our patrons. Some of them just, you know, me or John saying, dude, I want to talk to you about this thing. And then we get into it. And sometimes they get really personal. Like we've had some really 
profound conversations, I think, that have been part of Cinephile Shorts. And that's part of why it's such a joy to do those in addition to doing the regular show. Yeah, 100%. You know, these are the things that I look forward to a lot with our with our um, uh, discussion, Steve, is what is the topic? What is the subject? What are we going to discuss? And what's going to be revealed for both of us? Because I think we always discover something new about each other when we have these conversations and something new about our listeners and our patrons and our viewers uh, with when they suggest these uh, topics or when they send in these questions for us to discuss. And so and, and their responses to our conversations, which I think is always fun to read as well. So we're very blessed to have uh, and it sounds like I'm kissing y'all's asses, but it's true. A very intelligent, knowledgeable and um, um, circumspect bunch of people to be um, our listeners. And uh, we couldn't thank you enough for sure. I- I couldn't agree more. And and the best evidence of that, actually, John, was just about a month ago, we had our first advisory board yes. meeting that was absolutely fantastic. And this is for the $25 and above level that we have a monthly Zoom call where we get to see your faces and have a conversation. And we had a fantastic conversation about film, a fantastic conversation about the podcast, and a lot of help in picking the direction that it's going to go, including discussing our upcoming Halloween film, the yeah. director we're going to highlight in next year, our Christmas movie, and they even picked a movie that we're preparing right now that's coming up very soon so so that's shorts we've got ad free versions of the show you can ask questions you can ask questions for the live shows for the real show the advisory board like and our watch alongs which we just did a watch along of indiana jones and the kingdom of the crystal skull where i was well fortified with alcohol to get through that thing so (laughs) and so that's why we wanted to give you this brief intro to everything that you can get by joining us on patreon.com slash the cinephiles and one of our favorite things to do there is our cinephiles shorts Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new short from the Cinephiles. I am the outlaw, John Roca, joined, as always, by my co-host, Steve Morris. Hello. How are you today? Uh, I am in an interesting place, and uh, I am very glad in a way that we're having this conversation today. And for those of you who maybe didn't see the title for this short, we are discussing the WGA and SAG After Strikes that are going on right now against the AMPTP and all the drama that has popped up over the weekend as well um, concerning reviewers, influencers, cosplayers, a thing that I don't remember being an issue back when the strike happened in the 2008 was the last strike. Um, So it's an interesting situation to be in right now. What are your thoughts, Steve, as we uh, enter into this uh, first time since 1960 where the SAG uh, actors and the WGA writers are striking against the AMPTP? Well, first of all, in general, I'm in favor of the strikes. I'm in favor of the artists and believe that they should be compensated and believe that they should be treated with respect, which frequently they're not. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason I wanted to do this with you Mm -hmm. is that I think there's a misconception of people who don't work in our industry when they hear what the strike is about and they kind of go, oh, why should I? Like they might, maybe they'll hear that that an actor has a day rate of 1500 bucks or something. They'll go $1,500 for a day's work. And they're striking like, what the hell? I would kill to get $1,500. And what people don't understand, and this is part of why I wanted to do this with you, is that an actor getting paid or writing getting paid is the tip of the iceberg in terms of the work they did to get that gig. Yeah. So that actor who got that rate, and yeah, I agree, $1,500 for a day's work, that sounds awesome. Yeah. That actor might have auditioned for 50 things. They right. might have had to learn all these sets of lines and book none of them. That writer, I mean, I spent literally years pitching shows, you know, and didn't get paid a thing. And you get thrown back to you and do another rewrite or another pitch and you're working and you're working and working for nothing. And so when you book that gig, that gig has got to pay for all of the work you did to get there. Uh, do you feel okay, by the way? You yeah, suddenly, yeah, yeah. yeah no, okay, you look like... No, you look like you were squirming, and I know that you've had some stuff. Oh, no, no, no. Only because okay. th- this kind of stuff, I have to be very um, careful of my emotions yeah. with this kind of stuff. Normally, I like to, you know, um, have no problem voicing my opinion on a situation. But something about this strike, these strikes this time around, Steve, feel in- monumental and scary in a way yeah. that I don't think I felt when we were going through the strikes um, over a decade ago. Um, And I think it's because uh, this feels like if we don't make a stand here, 
there will be no more stands to make that matter. Um, very possible. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and for those who don't know or who maybe are not haven't read up on a lot of stuff, it is very focused on the amount of money um, that studios have been uh, slowly chipping away at that they pay all the creatives involved in the production of a film or a TV show, along with the very real threat of AI, which is going nowhere, uh, which is not going anywhere, rather, and is going to absolutely take jobs away from people. Even today, before we got on this call, I was just flipping through Twitter and I saw that one of these uh, uh, magazines uh, has created an all AI -ish, AI issue where every picture in it is an AI generated image. Every article written inside the magazine is an AI generated article. And that to me is the shot across the bow of them absolutely, studios, magazines, whatever, uh, absolutely disenfranchising writers. And eventually they'll disenfranchise actors. And if they could disenfranchise directors and have AI directed films, 100% they would do that. And so to me, this strike feels bone chilling in a way or a rever reverberating inside of my body in a way that I uh, have not felt. And, and I'm not sure I'm finished processing, to be honest with you, um, as I read some of these proposals and some of these uh, um, um, frustrating um, um, uh, counters by, by the AMPTP, which today there was a three page um, or last night it was it was leaked a three page back and forth between the SAG and the AMPTP, and it's it's offensive to read. You know? um, yeah, so so I I think the AI stuff and the money stuff are are very separate and they're very both very very important. Yeah, and just on the AI one because this is a, you know it's something I say to you all the time. This morning's the Daily, the New York Times podcast once again has another piece on AI, and this one. Oh, man, it's fucking chilling because yeah. it's it's the a writer and what she did. One of the things she did, and she was talking about artists like uh, and writers and mm -hmm. how their work is getting trolled on the internet by these AI, not trolled, but but read on the internet by all yeah. these AI chatbots, and then are then reproducing stuff in their style. And she, a New York Times writer, asked the chatbot to write something about AI with her style, her personal style as a writer. And they read that little piece and it was fucking chilling. And wow. as a person who spent a lot of time as a teacher reading students writing, yeah. this sounded like professional writing. It did not sound like a machine did it. It did. Did it sound like the greatest writing I'd ever heard? No. Did it sound like real writing that could easily repre replace someone? Oh yeah, it fucking did. Mm -hmm. So that's really scary right now. One of the things with actors is they're talking about, Hey, can I, for instance, we just literally got off a live show talking about what's yeah. going to happen with Indiana Jones. Well, how about an AI version of Harrison Ford making another 20 Indiana Jones movies? Yeah, That's a possibility we'd talk about. And that is exactly what they're talking about today. Yeah. And this is, and the thing, and again, this is what I want people who aren't in this industry to understand the level of vulnerability of a young actor coming to Hollywood or a young writer coming to Hollywood is so high and you're so desperate, so fucking desperate to get anything. This is why actors end up getting themselves into crappy situations. Yeah. One of them. And again, this goes to AI and creating images of people is nudity. Yes. You know? Yeah. So it's like, okay, what if, you know, you sign a deal for a gig and in that deal, because this is part of what's going in the contract is, we would like to have your image and voice to use in perpetuity, even with AI generated material. Yeah. So you're a young actor desperate for the gig and they go, great, you sign the thing. And then, Hey, guess what? You're, you're acting in a whole bunch of stuff that you're not getting paid for. And maybe that stuff will even show nudity, which you did not, didn't want to happen, but it's not your body. It's now an AI body that's fucked up. And yeah. that is some of the stuff that we're trying to figure out now. Yeah. And there seems to be no real, logical defense for what the AMPTP is doing. And, uh, you know, again, the, the, the energy feels evil. And I don't use that term lightly. Like, you know, it's fun to talk about it in movies. But in reality, evil is something you don't want to throw around to describe uh, things that are going on. Because something because it, it, it connotates something really um, just uh, scary to think about in terms of hum human actions. And certainly it feels that way when you look at some of the proposals or counter proposals from the AMPTP 
that it is so disrespectful to the creatives and what they bring to the table. It, this is a battle between a workforce and the overlords of that workforce trying to make the workforce work longer, harder, and for less money so that the overlords can profit off their hard work simply because they sit in an executive office and sign uh, creatives to do this work or they negotiate deals or they put stuff in motion. And it is unsettling how overvalued that position is and how undervalued creatives are in the construct. And just like we've seen in other areas of business, and I think our, our SAG president, and I should say full reveal, I am a SAG actor. Um, our SAG act president, Fran Drescher, which I am no big fan of, by the way, I thought she delivered an incredible press conference where she put it on the table exactly what is happening here from the AMPTP side of things and how they view creatives. And I think her, her passion was warranted in what she was saying and comparing it to other situations that we've seen recently where the haves want to crush the have-nots and put them under their boot so that the haves can have even more at the expense of the have-nots. And so when you talk about these people at the beginning of this short, of these people go like, why should I care about writers or actors who are making this much, who don't really understand how little we actually make. Only the 2%, 2 to 5% of actors make the Tom Hanks money, make the money to actually be able to afford a living. And those are the ones you see because they're the ones who are able to be out front and are seen by people. But there are so many other actors who are struggling day to day to try to pay their bills and try to, try to uh, you know, buy a house, God forbid, or put their kids through school, which every human being, let alone every American, should have a right to do. And so it just is so unsettling to see studios be so dismissive uh, about it and claim poverty, yet be completely afraid and terrified to open their books to be officially uh, looked at by any kind of government agency or any kind of representative of SAG or WGA or even DGA who signed their agreement. So I just find that to be so evil, I guess, for lack of a better term, man. Uh, I, I'm, look, I'm with you. I want to I want to just clarify a thing that you said, because I want to make sure to, that, yeah. that I would say probably the Tom Hanks or the Tom Cruise. That's like point oh one percent. Oh, yeah. Well, fair, 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 fair. Yeah. I think that the, the, what, what your point is, is it's really only maybe five percent of sag actors that are actually just paying their rent yes you know right yes. because because it's it's a it's an industry with like an 85 percent unemployment rate yeah, yeah, yeah you know because it's all these actors which again that is a system that is ripe for abuse because if if ten thousand new young actors show up in la and they're all desperate to get a part and unemployment is really high well then all the advantage is with the people that are hiring is with the producers yeah. you know and the thing is and and the thing too is that people like tom hanks and tom cruise and, and maybe other people named tom their, their situation is so vastly different from those actors that it's only if they're really looking back and really looking out for those younger actors because their situation it just doesn't apply to anything else yeah. you know and and frankly i think they're a problem too in the sense that I understand that business is everyone wants to negotiate for the best deal for them. Yeah. And I also understand as someone who has produced movies is that it costs a lot of money and you're pinching a lot of pennies and that that of course is business and we're going to negotiate and all that stuff. But if you have one group of people that are making millions of fucking dollars and other people who are desperately trying to get one more hour of work in order to get healthcare for the year, yeah. we're in a situation where my sympathy is very clearly with the latter. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. like, I don't give a fuck about whether or not Tom Cruise makes an extra $10 million on a movie. And I certainly don't give a fuck yeah. about whether or not the CEO of Warner Brothers is bringing down another $50 million. Like, no, fuck you. You're not making great movies and you're not going to crush all the people that are trying to make movies in order for you to get another 10 million bucks. I don't care about that. You know? Yeah. So I'm Bear with you on evil, by the way. Okay. Okay. Yeah. B Barry Diller said this. Yesterday, I think, where he said that the top, the one, as you said, as you said, Steve, the 0.01% of actors need to also kind of drop their salary demands. And I got to be honest with you, I said something like that as well in one of the uh, uh, conversations, I think, with Jeff on the hot mic, where I thought I was, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with reducing 
the top 0.01% actors' salaries if we can distribute more of the money down the chain to these actors. But the studios must also meet that by cutting executive salaries as well yeah, and, and putting that money into the system so that everybody benefits and, and everybody, like production people, acting people, everybody benefits from that situation. So you have a happy workforce. And, and this is where I, I think we start to see these budgets, right? Like the creator is about to come out uh, in a few months, and that's from uh, Gareth Edwards. And that budget they released, $86 million for that movie. And you look at that trailer and you're like, what? How did they do this for $86 million? Where, why is Indiana Jones and Dow Destiny $290 million? Why are all these things so high, right? And so you opening the books means opening the books on everyone. And I want to make that clear. I'm consistent here. I want the books opened on everything, which means if you've got an actor slash producer who is pocketing much more than he should be or he or she should be pocketing, cut that fucking money right away. And I think those are the things that you have to open up. If they're skimming off the top for their own benefit, expose them, whether it's an executive or an actor or director or writer or producer, whoever, expose it. And once and for all, so we can all come back to a level playing field again and then build a better infrastructure and system that is good for everybody. And as you said earlier, Steve, makes it something aspirational for a young actor, director, producer, creative writer who wants to come to Hollywood and pursue their dream. Uh, and too many people want to shit on creatives and go, well, you chose that profession. A coal miner who has his coal company shut down on him or her and can't find another job. Do you say that to them? Do you say that to them and go, well, you chose to be a coal miner. Like that's so insensitive and a fucking dick move. And it drives me nuts when I hear people who are also struggling paycheck to paycheck, having no sympathy for people who are doing in the same position because they view their job as somehow more of the old school working class blue collar thing versus acting, writer, directing who they see as some kind of elitist nonsense never mind that they own a bunch of movies so it just is so frustrating to me to see this disconnect um and it's it, when it's really a hard hard job that asks so much of you and just because you're not clocking in and clocking out every day as you're trying to become this actor writer director doesn't mean it, it doesn't have value you know so, so I have so many thoughts. The, the first one I would say is what's really hard when you come from, like if you're looking at the AFL-CIO or you're looking hmm. at a, a, another union, right? There's going to be a range of the people that just started out within the union and the, you know, the foreman who's been on the job for 40 years. And, yeah, yeah, and that yeah. foreman is going to make maybe two or three times as much as the person just starting out, maybe four times as much. Right. There's no other union that contains within it, within it members who are barely scraping by who work yeah. and members who are making $150 million a year. There's no other union that has to deal with that kind of a range. Yeah, 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 and right. what the problem is, is the most visible people are the people that are making shit tons of money. Right. And so when people think about it, they go, oh, but, you know, why are those people complaining? That's the first thing. The second thing is that, and, and I know I've told this story before, but my company's named Team Effort Films and Team Effort Films came about, A, when I was shooting my second movie in film school and realized I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. And my partner, Byron, who knew how to run a camera, had saved my ass. And that's where the term Team Effort Films came from. And it really developed actually when Byron was directing the first movie that I wrote out of film school, the first feature. And I went, wouldn't it be great if everybody who worked on a movie shared in the movie? And so the whole vision of Team Effort Films was that everyone from the PA to the star would have a percentage of the film. That was the idea. And the reason and the thing that happens is that Tom Cruise or who I don't mean to keep naming him, but the yeah. movie star is like, you are super, you are so valuable to this movie. We, you know, you are the whole movie. We're going to kiss yeah. your ass in every fucking way, including money. And I'm not saying that those people aren't that valuable, right. but I think the fucking PA is really valuable too, because sometimes the PA who had to make the run at the last minute to get the other film stock that you had the wrong film stock and showed up just in time and stayed up all night to do the fucking thing. He saved your movie too. Yeah. Does that mean he should make what Tom Cruise makes? Absolutely not. But we don't value those people. And you know, and I know, like if you watch the Imagineering documentary oh, yeah. that was on Disney, how many hours did those fucking people work to pull off the shit they pulled off? Yeah. It was everybody working, hundred, you know, just 
20 hours a day, not sleeping, not sleeping, not sleeping to get a thing done. And all of those names that are at the end of Mission Impossible or Dial of Destiny, they're all those people. And those people, again, they're not getting their insurance. And so, yeah, I'm 100, 100% with you that the big movie stars and the big executives across the board should be making less money. Yeah. So that these other people, including the actors who come in for a day part, including PAs, including special effects people, including writers assistants, including all those people who are being forced to work way more than 40 hour weeks. I mean, 60 hour week is a standard in Hollywood. Right. That's where you start, you know. And so those people deserve to get a bump. Like it is. It, it, I mean, I have I have no you know me. I mean, I, I, I like to make money. I have literally I don't have a strong desire to be super rich. And I have do not believe that Jeff Bezos or a name, whatever fucking multimillionaire deserves to make that much more money when people that work for them are struggling. That's fuck that. Yeah, I agree hundred percent. And that's the frustrating part of it all is that um, that's where the, the, the devaluing of people who work hard for your company uh, to help you live high on the hog. Somehow we have just kind of forgotten the little guy or little girl, whatever you want to say. Yeah, a woman, I guess, uh, and 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 it's been so frustrating because we all want to, we it's inherent within I would say ninety to ninety five percent of Americans to work. It is an inherent thing to want to work, to want to be a value, to achieve, to make money, to pay your bills, to enjoy life. These are the things that we do. What gets pushed is the ridiculous narrative that everybody is lying around wanting to be lazy, um, and only the genius of business construct forces people to work and that's madness that's utter madness you know it's drilled into us from the day from day one that working is important because we watch our parents work we watch our our, our family members or extended family members work in order to achieve certain things they, those things were told from the beginning if you, if you want to buy a present if you want to buy yourself this you're going to have to work if you want to do this. so those things are really instilled in us from the beginning and i think what Sometimes people like AMPTP and other other of these other these overlords do is try to s s pollute the water with these narratives of oh they're just a bunch of lazy actors sitting around on unemployment waiting to uh, get the job. Um, and I'm not saying there aren't a, a few of those, but it is not the standard in any way, shape, or form. Um, actors are some of the hardest working people in the business, and as Steve said, also. These people who are, quote unquote, below the line, which I hate the above the line, below the line terms. But just to clarify, those are the people who are not in front of the camera. They work incredibly hard, long hours so that these actors can look good on camera doing the things that they're doing. And they don't get paid at the level that I think is fair for people who do those kinds of, of jobs. So, yeah, Steve, it makes an excellent point here. You know, The money has to be spread all around. And, and, and I'll say, you know, anyone who has who thinks that these are lazy people has not spent a lot of time on movie sets. They haven't spent a lot of time right. like this is like serious. Ser and yeah, of course, they're lazy people in every profession. But in order to succeed in this world, you got to fucking hustle. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a lot of the hustle is hustle to get the jobs. That's yes. that is particularly for an actor and for a writer, too. Those are the main things. And I want to point out something yeah. else as well. And this is maybe harder to get your head around again if you're not in the industry. But. The way that in particular TV for writers was set up in the past, there was a way for young writers to be mentored by older writers mm. and given opportunities that that would last them and help them grow into the next level. Yeah. And because of the way they've changed the way TV is made, because we've gone from a 22 episode season to a 10 episode season. And because of these the way the show is picked up or these mini rooms and all this stuff that you might've yeah. heard about, those opportunities have gone away. And, yep. and so what it used to be was you came on as a writer's assistant to a 22 episode show. You're not getting paid a lot, but you're really involved and you're in the room. And the writer, the head writer will hand you a script so you can get your first script made. And there are 22 yep. episodes. So they have room for it. And maybe that head writer would rewrite you a lot. But your name would stay on the script, mm -hmm. which would allow you to get that credit, which would allow you either to get in the union or move forward or move on to the next show to go to the next level. And when you went to 10 episodes and these things called mini rooms, you they might bring in a writer for a week's work who would pitch an idea and do an outline. Yeah. But then they're not hired to write the script. So they don't get that credit. 
the head writer writes the script because of the way the money is now working. That's more advantageous to them. And so what ended up happening was you busted your ass to get just one week's work yeah. rather than a script that goes on the air that you can get residuals off of because you're not going to get residual payments anymore. So the both the mentoring, bringing your career along is done differently. That's much, much less advantageous to a young writer. And money wise, you get fucked because yeah. you could get brought in for four. And the thing too, and this is again, a reality. You're yeah. an actor, you go into an audition, you don't get the part, but you did something interesting in the audition. And now you're watching the TV show a month later, or a couple of months later. And Hey, they put that in the movie, in right. the show, right? That happens all the time. The same happens with writers who pitch. Cause what will happen is a producer will go like, I want to do a family comedy set in the future. That's blah, blah, blah. And they'll take a whole bunch of pitches. And so you go in and go, well, this is how I would approach this thing. And you do a lot of work to do that. You write up pages, you go through things, you do your pitch and they go, ah, thanks. We're going to pass. But strangely enough, one of the ideas you were pitching ends up in the show. Yeah. That happens all the fucking time. And it's a thing that's going to happen more now with the way they've restructured this. So it's again, one mm -hmm. more way that writers do a ton of work for zero money or actors do a ton of work for zero money. Yeah. get screwed yeah and i think that you know that leads us back to the ai thing for sure because if oh, yeah. an ai can generate similar content but different enough that you can't sue um a studio for using or a, a production company for using your idea as you were pitching in the room but you submitted it there's the uh, rub as well how are they gonna rule on something like that and so ai can be used as a barrier between the um, studio heads or the people in charge of the production company and the writer, because they can say, well, the AI generated, we didn't write it. The AI generated it. And that's what we used. Right. So it's, it's offering yet another barrier, another thing you have to go over. And how many of these writers, actors or directors or produce or um, uh, creatives have uh, the amount of money that you need to have in order to sue a movie studio or production company let alone deal with the blacklisting that would accompany you suing a company or a studio for stealing your idea. So there's it's super all of these hard, yeah. things that are, yeah, there's all these things that are set up to make it easier for studios to exploit their workers. Um, and I'm proud that SAG-AFTRA is fighting back as, as strongly as it is because I have not been proud in the past of how they've capitulated at times. And I think that's also to be fair one of the reasons why we're in this boat that we're in now, where so many people are working for so much less than they were before. You know, there's a, there's a great documentary called the guy from that thing or that person from that. Thing. Oh yeah. 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 And in that documentary, you can watch a bunch of character actors who all of you who are listening to us have probably seen in numerous projects talk about the life, how the life was like in the eighties and nineties and how they could live off doing guest star roles and doing commercials and nationals and whatever, and they, it was a comfortable existence. But the studios got upset about that, and so they incrementally have cut all that money away from actors to where Ginger Gonzaga posted, I think, that she got offered $396. This is a SAG actress. $396 to be on a, um, to be on a Netflix show as a guest star. And with Jeez. no residuals, by the way. Just for, And then out, out of that $396, taxes get taken out, She's yep. got to pay 10% to her manager, 10% to her agent. And if she's got a lawyer, 5% probably to her lawyer. And by that time, what do you, you haven't made dick. You've made less than minimum wage for the amount of hours you've spent memorizing, uh, getting every, that into your body, performing on set, and then, you know, uh, finishing up your day on the set. So, um, and if it's multiple days on a set, that's even worse. So it's just those kinds of things that you, that people don't factor in when they consider, um, what's going on here and why actors and writers are fighting back now in order to be um, taken seriously and in, in, in paid accordingly. Well, again, this is not a fight for most actors about making millions of bucks. Right. This, yes. is, this is a fight about getting enough for a Prius and a one bedroom apartment in Glendale. That's what <laughs> yeah. they're, Living that's well. what they're fighting for. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I will say too, just, just, just the tiniest bit on the other side. Yeah. Do I think SAG is perfect? No, SAG, as, as a producer, having dealt with SAG multiple, SAG can be a pain in the fucking ass. Mm -hmm. You know, is WGA always make the right decisions? No, they do not. Yeah. Like it is, they're, 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 it's not that these are perfect entities, but but I, you know, this is why I'm a union, a pro union person. Is that yeah. in general, in a choice between the little guy and the big guy? <laughs> yeah. If yeah. I know nothing else, I'm going to side with the little guy. 
Yeah. That doesn't mean there isn't truth on the other. I mean, there, you know, there are things dealing with SAG where it's like, Jesus, this is going to cost me. You know, the, the, the way right. SAG works is, is like, let's say you have a budget that's under, a, you have to be under a half a million bucks, let's say. If you spend a half a million in one dollar, your movie now costs one point two million. Like that's <laughs> you know that's kind of because all these rate increases happen, right? And right. it's like, look, I just so you literally going, I can't spend that extra fucking dollar. Or I get, I mean, there's all sorts of weird things. Or like SAG will take your money on a bond, so yeah. I had to pay all the money for salary to say, sorry, I'll just bitch about this very quickly. No, that is before great. you make yeah. the movie, yeah, you, you, SAG says, well, how much in salary do you think you're going to pay your actors? You go, I'm gonna, I think it estimates out based on my budget, eighty thousand dollars for the actors, and they go, great, give us all that money in advance. So before you can sign a SAG contract, you have to send the $80,000 that you pay to the actors to SAG. Right. Then the actor's agents, after they work, you submit to SAG this actor work, and then the agent has to pursue SAG to get the money. Well, right. SAG doesn't pay them right away. SAG goes, oh, we'll pay you soon because SAG wants to hold on to your money to get interest on it. Yeah. And so the, then the agents come to you. Why is not my actor got paid? I'm like, I don't have any money. I gave all my money to SAG. <laughs> so no, these are not perfect systems. They're very yeah. complicated and irritating. Yeah. But, part, but the reason they take that bond, again, is because there are producers who say, oh, yeah, I'm going to totally pay you. And then they don't pay their actors. Yeah. So because that has happened many, many, many times, SAG yes. goes, you got to give us all the money first because we don't fucking trust you for good reason. That's why that exists. Oh, yeah, because, I mean, non-union producers screwed over actors and creatives all the time uh, well, in, yeah. in the process. Yeah, which is why the union was formed, to be honest. And, and yeah. To fight back those kinds of things. But yeah, Steve's right. It's not a perfect process on either side. And it's just the way it is. But it, it is very clear what is going on here and that is the uh, actors are tired of working for so little uh, in the long run and the ai thing you know we, we, we've talked about it a little bit but it's also about this idea of ai taking your likeness in perpetuity i think uh, dustin duncan crabtree ireland said it really well in that press conference as well when he said like the one they submitted to us a quote-unquote groundbreaking ai proposal um and that included that they would be able to scan the background actors and use their likeness in perpetuity. So in essence, not only are they underpaying the uh, name actors who are considered guest stars or recurring or leads, they wanted the, the ability to not even hire background actors anymore and use AI background actors to save money on productions so that all that money goes back to the studio, all that money goes back to these producers who are and, direct and possible directors sometimes who are making money off these movies the, uh, when they cut the budgets on these other things, more of that money flows back into their wallets. And that is just horrific that they wanted. Plus, the, the de again, the dehumanizing of it all is I'm going to take your individual face body and use it whenever the fuck I want. And that's leading back to what you started out with, this idea of young actors agreeing to do these things because they want to establish themselves. I swear to God, the shit I did starting out in this business in the first few years I was out here, I am fucking ashamed of to think about sometimes of the rights I gave up just to be able to be on something or, or just to be able to audition for something, you know, and, and those are the things I remember when I get a proposal for a show that was going to shoot in New York recently for the job I do now, which is hosting and reviewing movies and, and doing the podcast with Steve and other people. And, and they offered me something that where they locked me into a contract for such a minimal amount of money for six years. And I'd be unable to be the host of any other show on a, on a name network if I agreed to this. And because I would not do that, but I would still come in and do the audition for the test to help them develop the show, they refused to um, sign me up for the show because I wouldn't give them six years of my life that they would be able to um, uh, trigger whenever the show got approved. So it's just madness how they how they want to abuse creatives. And I had the executive producer call me, who is the father of the friend of mine, and he was like, "Hey, just look at it as a you know a free trip to New York every time you come to shoot." That's how they. And he, I was like, "What is wrong with you? How can you even think that that's a way to approach an adult human being?" But it's this idea of trying to trick you into accepting less so that these other people can bring their dreams to fruition and make money off of it. And it's the things you have to be aware of. And I love that, again, that, you know, SAG is and, and WGA are finally pushing back against this nonsense. 
Well, and this is and this is why unions exist. Like people who mm. go like, yeah. look, why can't the why can't the fry guy at McDonald's just in, in negotiate their own contract if they're not <laughs> getting paid well? And it's yeah. like, you know why? Because the fry guy at McDonald's can't do that. Yeah. Because the fry guy at my, McDonald's just gets fired. Plus, you know, he's 19 years old and he doesn't know what his rights are or anything. The reason that you have a union is to protect the young, young John Roker or the young Steve Morris to yeah. si from signing away their rights when they show up. Like, no, you can't do it that way. Yeah. One other thought I have, and I know this is turning into a medium or a long, but <laughs> one other quick thought I have is that there was the expectation when I first started, when I was at film school, is right when digital editing came out. So oh, yes. they're not going to cut on film. I learned how to cut both on film and then cut on Avid. And everyone went, oh, it's going to save the studio so much money. And movies got more expensive and post took longer. And then as CGI starts to come out, rather than practical effects, people went, oh, it's going to save the studio so much money. We don't have to buy, build all these things and cam do them in camera. We just build them in computers. And guess what? No, everything got more expensive. The yeah. more computer technology we bring into the system, which we think is going to save us money, ends up costing money in the long run. So yeah. I do have a weird hope on some level that, yeah, AI can do a lot of crazy. It's some crazy shit it can do. Yeah. But me behind a camera filming you in front of a camera is actually really cheap. Yeah, You know, yeah. if we're not trying to do special, if we're just telling a story together and you just need a few humans to do it. You can actually tell a story relatively inexpensively yeah. and not have to do all this AI. So maybe one small silver lining is there's going to be more independent film of with people that don't want to go down this route. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe yeah. that's a possibility. Yeah. We'll monitor that uh, for sure, Stu. Oh. <sighs> feel like this has wiped you out a bit yeah yeah is yeah i mean you know it's just because there's i don't know what the end result's going to be and um an, another element of this and i don't want to extend it any longer but just throw this in there like seeing people turn on each other over the weekend on these influencers people who are not and reviewers right and critics people who have youtube channels people who are not in any way connected to unions or are union members but not official representatives were going after people in my space about them reviewing movies and were trying to stop people reviewing movies and talking about movies in a completely pig-headed attempt to say, well, if you do this, you're helping the studios. No, I'm helping the actors, the writers, the directors, the producers, uh, the below the line and above the line people who worked really hard to make this movie come to fruition. I can acquiesce by not even mentioning the studio in a review. And that is happily what I will do. But like the people were so vitriolic, some of these people going after influencers and essentially doing what the studios want you to do, which is to implode from the inside out to, I mean, the one of the reasons they want it, they want to, I mean, you saw that interview or if you've read that article in deadline where that executive who wouldn't name themselves said that w the approach here is that the studios are want to starve writers out to where they're desperate that they're going to go into foreclosure so that they force their union to accept the lowest minimal terms that are favorable to the AMPTP. And that is disgusting. And you saw Ron Perlman, if you guys haven't seen this, Ron Perlman essentially threatening the life of Bob Iger, which was really shocking to see um, and felt very real in what he was saying and that tells you the level of what we're dealing with. That tells you what is happening here. So, you know, people want to portray actors as these, like, you know, tree-hugging, uh, simping idiots. There are plenty of strong-ass actors who are quite willing to engage in, in dangerous crossing of the lines in a situation like this because you're attacking their livelihood. They're not attacking their ability to put a second garage in their house. You're attacking their livelihood, their ability to put food on the table, not for a family, just for themselves. And so that's why you're going to get these kinds of responses and this tone deaf response from Bob Iger and from David Zaslav and all these other CEOs. It's just all combined into becoming a, a just a, um, a a soup of trouble uh, overall. And it's just frustrating to see that they even influencers or reviewers or critics or people who are struggling to be successful on YouTube. And I would argue that I am struggling to be successful on YouTube at the level that I want to be at are being attacked by these people in their absolutely off base approach to somehow showing solidarity for the strike. It's a whole, I mean, I had one of the, one of my friends call me crying Steve over the weekend about 
the guilt she feels that these people were trying to throw on her for daring to review movies. And it was like, what the fuck is going on here? So it's a so, real quagmire of shit right now. Well, this is the problem when people's emotions get high and they get very much in, mm. you know, into silos. I mean, first of all, again, this is why by default, I will side with the little guy versus the big guy. Yeah. Because the tactic you describe of we're just waiting until they can't make their next mortgage payment or are scared to lose their house and then they're negotiate. That is what, that's what, how strikes work. Yep. Is that the, the people running the company try to wait out the people who are starving and those people have to make sacrifice until they get the better deal. And that goes all the way back to the beginning of unions and strikes in this country. That's what, and it's, it's fucking sucks, you know, but yeah. that is what it's about. Um, as far as the, the, you know, critics and reviewers, I don't, I really don't get the argument. Yeah. I'm not, you know, it's like, I mean, and part of it is, is frankly, I was, I was unsuccessful under the system that existed and part mm. of the reason you and i do the cinephiles yeah. or i do other things is because i go oh i i don't want to play in those waters anymore yeah, yeah, yeah i'm going to you know i mean and i've done this uh literally since college of i can't seem to find a way to do this thing i want to do within the system i will step outside of the system and do it myself yeah stepping outside of the system that's where the assistance came from that's where you know the second shark movie comes from like it's like we're just gonna fucking do it ourselves i am not crossing a picket line if you know when yeah. i produce my own movie i mean yeah. well actually maybe that one actually would have been because there was a sag strike i would use sag actors so in that case the assistance would be shut down and that's mm -hmm. rightly so okay for the shows that we for doing the cinephiles or for you know we were just talking about temple of doom that's yeah. us just talking yeah. We're not crossing a picket line. I'm not taking a SAG actor's job. We're yeah. literally just talking. We just talked about Temple of Doom, a 40-year-old fucking movie. Yeah. This idea that one cannot express their opinion and that you are therefore going against the strike, that does not make sense to me at all. I don't yeah. get it. Yeah. I mean, I know the one of the elements is that, well, some of these influencers who are higher level, um, you know, get paid by the studios to promote their movies, right? Not just review, but promote. Uh, I get that. And so I, I'm not in that camp. I have not achieved that level where studios pay me to promote. When they send me swag, it's just swag. So I don't get paid to put it up on my Instagram. It's just fun to put it out there and, and they're cool little things. And I do it for free. I don't get paid to put stuff up on Instagram or anything like that. So to me, it didn't, it didn't bother me, this kind of stuff. But and give me a second of hesitation. But I understand from the higher level ones, a hundred thousand or more subscribers on YouTube studios do pay them. And that's an ugly truth of Hollywood is that studios pay these people who are also supposedly reviewers to promote their movies. And I always think it's a weird, uh, it seems unethical to me, but you know, yeah, it's a weird nebulous line. And, uh, I, I, you know, I, I just want to live off what I, with the videos I'm making, the, the stuff we do on the center the stuff we do, I, I do on other podcasts, that's what I'm focused on. I do not want to become a paid publicity arm of the studio. That's not what my goal is here. And I rejected doing that at Collider when they wanted to change our approach to talking about movies and TV shows and saying, don't say anything negative about any of the actors, directors, studios, uh, projects, nothing. Just uplift it. Talk about it all the time. Make it something people are excited about. And I was like, what the fuck is that? I found I found that to be offensive because then you're just essentially doing free publicity for a studio. Yeah, and you're that, just, like, an, just you're an ad man. Yeah, you're you know? an ad man. Just so you can have access to these people. And that's the the hero worship nonsense that I just don't buy into. I mean, unless it's Tom Cruise, of course. I just don't buy into it uh in 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 that way. So um I understand where my where the way higher influencers who are in my space were having conundrums about it, and but the People down where I'm at, I mean, leave us the fuck alone. You know, we're, we're yeah, trying to I, exist and survive. Yeah. I mean, this is this would be a topic for an entire other short. Yeah, but yeah. I'll just say, I really wish there was more space for people to accept that you can be my ally and not line up 100 percent with everything I think. Great that points. you can be adjacent. Yeah. Yeah, because you've I've never heard you say anything that wasn't supporting the the writers, mm. wasn't supporting the actors, that wasn't yeah. supporting the strike. Yeah you're an ally you know <laughs> like yeah. we don't have to agree on every fucking thing yeah, and yeah, yeah. you don't have to walk off your job because they walked off their job yeah. like that's you could yeah. still be supportive you know that's yeah. they're not the same thing and, and be supportive what, what, oh, in many ahead. ways steve yeah good so. of course no i'm sorry i was going to change the subject this is the one other small thing i want yeah, to yeah. say is just 
a, a, you know, a friend of my kid's dad is the head cook. He runs the kitchen at like Raleigh Studios or something. Oh, He's had to lay, lay all his people off. Like that's the other that you just got to yeah. keep in mind is that when the writers and the both the writers and actors are now on strike, there are literally hundreds of thousands of people that do all kinds of jobs that are not working because of this. This right. is a this is a big fucking deal. Yeah. And it's all because, in my mind, the studios won't pay a living wage to these actors, writers and directors, even though DJ did sign their deal, um, it, it, which is what causes all of this. If the studios yep. would just pay a living wage, a decent living wage to these people, nobody would need to be laid off. Nobody would need to lose their jobs or go on unemployment. And that's the thing that the, that the, they're striking for is a living wage and respect in the AI situation. So, yeah. Um, all right. There we go. That's our conversation on the strike, uh, the, the WGA strike and the SAG after strike. Um, we hope we've explained, um, you know, positions on this and the history of it and gave you a little more perspective on what's going on from the ground floor for Steve and I, who live on the West Coast. Steve, a director, uh, writer and actor, me and producer, me, you know, uh, actor, uh, voiceover artist, and also host of these uh, shows along with Steve and host these shows. So hopefully we're giving you some perspective on all of this and uh, that you can take with you. And um, if you have any questions, of course, you can always DM us or send us a, a tweet or whatever, and, and we'll be happy to answer uh, any of that for you. So um, Steve, any final words before we wrap up? No, I just hope that this, I, it doesn't seem to be any sign that it's ending soon, but for all the people that we care about and all the people that are out of work right now, I really hope they work this shit out. Yeah, agreed. I echo Steve's sen sentiments. Absolutely. Um, all right. Thank you all so much for joining us for this uh, Cinephile Short, or for listening, rather, to the Cinephile Short, and, of course, for being patrons of the Cinephiles. We love and appreci you, appreciate you all madly, for sure. And we'll talk to you next time with a another brand new episode of the Cinephile Shorts. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Cinephile Shorts. I am the outlaw, John Roca, joined, as always, by my co-host, Steve Morris. How are you, Steve? I am very good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. And today we're talking about something that was uh, suggested by a few patrons, or actually, and a few listeners. Uh, they wanted us to talk about um, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Now, those of you who follow me on social media, you know we already did a Geek Buddy spoiler review. You've read my thoughts, but Steve Morris... What are your thoughts on Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, the fifth installment in the Indiana Jones uh, franchise? This one directed by James Mangold, featuring Harrison Ford returning, Phoebe Waller-Bridge here, Toby Jones, and also Mads Mikkelsen. Um, let's get into it. What are your overall thoughts with the movie? You know, it's so funny with a movie like this where it's so where there's so much anticipation. Mm. There's all this stuff going into it, which is like, Okay, I hear what happened at Cannes, which gives me sort of a mixed reaction. Right, and then, mixed reviews, yeah. You know, and then I heard, you know, your non-spoiler review. I saw how Matt's felt about it. I yeah. saw all these other things. And I've been, in my anticipation, bopping back and forth between, don't get your hopes up, you know, I'm, we're just hoping for better than Crystal Skull. <laughs> and then and then having this sort of, maybe this is going to be good. Maybe, maybe it's going to be good. So I went in with my expectations fairly low. Yeah. And I totally liked it. Okay. I totally liked it. Liked I, it. That's the word you're using on purpose. Yes. No, I, I, I'm i not using it by accident. Right. So, so do I think it is up there with Last Crusade and Raiders? I do not. Mm -hmm. Do I think it is down there with Crystal Skull? I definitely, definitely do not. Mm -hmm. Did it feel totally like an Indiana Jones movie? And did I get a good, like ending on this character who I absolutely adore. Yes, yes it did. So, I really I really enjoyed it. And maybe and maybe liked is slightly less strong than I should say, which is okay. I really liked it, you okay. know. All right. Did I love it? Just no, but I really really liked it. <laughs> but you may left off one film to compare it to. Where is it in the Temple of Doom comparison? Is it better than Temple of Doom or less than Temple of Temple? Of Doom? Here's how I'm going to answer that question because we're going to go into some Temple of Doom. Right. I mean, we're, we're devoting serious time to uh, Mr. Henry Jones Jr., I yeah. think, on The Cinephiles, because we're going to do a live Temple of Doom show, hopefully, with your geek buddy, Shannon McClung and Michael Vogel. Yeah. So here, here's what I'll say. This Sunday is, is yeah. the plan, yeah. I listened to you guys on The Geek Buddies where you were ranking uh, all the films. Mm -hmm. and my And again, I'm right with all of you in that, for me, I think Raiders and Last Crusade are very, very close. Yeah. And what I would say, for the, and I really am answering your question, even though it doesn't sound like it at all. <laughs> yeah, you're moving around it. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get there because here's the deal: is I think 
for pure action, if we're just judging action sequence, Raiders is the better film. Right. If we're judging heart, then Last Crusade is the better film. Mm. Is that Raiders doesn't have real emotional depth to it. It's just this great adventure. So Last Crusade delivers better on that. That is actually how I feel about Temple of Doom. If it's just judging action sequences, yeah, I, I love Temple of Doom. Mm -hmm. If it's judging heart, well, yeah. there's no heart in Temple of Doom, and there is real heart here, and I think this is better in that sense. Interesting analysis, because, I mean, some people might push back on you and say, well, the Marion Ravenwood in Raiders of the Lost Ark, that stuff with him and her and Indy, that's got a heart to it, but you think it doesn't have enough heart for it to kind of push it across the finish line over Last Crusade in the heart category. Well, let me ask you this. Does Raiders ever make you cry? Cry. I uh, know. I don't think Raiders has ever made me cry. But it last has say, you get you long for a partner like Marion Ravenwood. Oh, I love Marion Ravenwood. Yeah, yeah. But it's but, but, but yeah. yeah. Does Last Crusade ever get you a little teary eyed? Well, sure. Um, but heart isn't just about tears, right? Heart is also about uh, love and connection and uh, emotion. And I really like the relationship with him and Ravenwood. But that being said, and I'm only playing devil's advocate, I agree with you. I think I'm more connected emotionally to the story in Last Crusade, although I enjoy, as you said, the action more in Raiders. Yeah. Uh, I find it to be more inventive than what we get in Last Crusade. I, I, I think you can't beat the action sequences in Raiders from, from the, you know, the truck, the truck, the fight outside the plane, the opening sequence. Like they're all, they're all like. 10% better than anything in Last Crusade. Yeah, but the, yeah. but we're not talking Last Crusade. Yeah, I, yeah. Like, we're talking Dial of Destiny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they did a great job with old Indy, old curmudgeonly, mm -hmm. you know, with the, the split from Marion and all that stuff. I thought that worked really well. I love uh, the character of Helena. I think she is fantastic. Yeah, and I, this is a controversial character. So what are your thoughts on this, Steve? Because a lot of people felt like, oh, they're bringing in a woman. We're sidelining side men again. She punches out Indiana Jones uh, near the end of the movie. Um, and she, and in essence, this is a bit of a two-hander, Steve. Oh, yeah. Her and his move. I, I, I don't get it. I mean, the, you know, it's like, I, can you explain to me, like, what, what? It's like to me is like is she a good character or is she not? Is it well performed or is she not? Is it well written? Is her or did you enjoy her on screen? This yeah. whole like I don't know, it's like putting some weird political spin on it. Like oh, a woman can't punch out Indy. Marion Ravenwood punches Indy in the first film. Yes, yeah, true. It's very true. Yeah. Like yeah. I, you know, and then we have in Last Crusade we have this whole, you know love interest slash villain who does all sorts of villainous stuff. She sleeps like, with his dad. Yeah. She, I mean, like. What I don't know, I don't understand this stuff. I think she was fantastic, and I love the difference in the kind of rogue that she is compared to old man Indiana Jones. You know, yes, I agree. It's it's watching the younger version of himself in her because yes, she's a little more. She's kind of a combo of Han Solo and Indy. If I yeah. can use the connection, because she does kind of break these rules. We see that whole sequence with her and that ex husband or the guy she was going to marry who she was clearly using for whatever reason right. is mania about it all but she really at times comes across as someone who could care less about what indiana jones thinks and that's because there's family trauma here with what she kind of blames indy for which is driving her father mad with this uh, pursuit of this artifact so in a way you can understand why she's standoffish why she's willing to push indy plus this is an, an older time where women are much more marginalized than they were than they are today. So a woman surviving in essentially what is a man's world, having to do what she can do to stay alive and stay uh, and stay in a position that she's in, she's going to do what she has to do. And so I think that puts off people sometimes when they see a woman who doesn't need man, who doesn't need to be catered to, doesn't need to cater to a man. I think that upsets some people sometimes when they're watching these movies, which is confounding to me because a yeah. man does it and it's okay. You know? Yeah, I, I don't get I don't get this whole thing. Like, like, it's like, is it successful or is it not successful? If you right. don't, if you, you know, it's like, if you enjoyed it, then it worked. If you didn't enjoy it, I'm sorry, it didn't work. But for me, it's like, I think they did a perfect job of creating parallels with Indiana Jones and his relationship to his father. Yes. Without, yeah. without duplicating those things. Like, it's not that she's not in exactly the same place Indiana was in relationship to Sean Connery. Right. But they have a similar trauma with a, a parent obsessed with a thing. Yeah. And the direction that she goes in dealing with that trauma is to become a rogue who's just in it for the money. Right. You know, I'm never going to be passionate about a thing. And, and and Indiana goes a different direction. And both of them in these 
two films. And, and again, it's why I think these are the two films with the most, what I'll say, heart, yeah. is that she then has to resolve that. She has to find a way to resolve that. And Indiana Jones, instead of her resolving with her father, Indiana Jones is in a weird way a stand-in, yeah. you know, for a father figure. Uh, who doesn't want to be a father figure? You know, like, I, I think the place that we find Indiana Jones is so sad and so good. And it really, really makes sense of like, yeah, you're not going on these adventures anymore. Hmm. You you ha- you do have problems in your personal life and you're all alone, you know? Yeah. Too many young people who watch these movies or people in their 30s or 40s are don't understand like that. That happens as you get older. They hate seeing their heroes get older, right? And I I understood the anger towards Luke in Last Jedi because I think I liked what Ryan Johnson wanted to do with that. I don't think he effectively pulled it off, and I think that's where my disagreement with it on Luke is. I wanted more backstory, more of the reasons for why he ended up the way he did. With Indiana Jones, I think it's very clear and it's very obvious, and especially throwing in what happened to Mutt, that can affect so many people in so many different ways. Why wouldn't it drive a schism between him and Marion and him? And, and the thing that old men have a hard time, and this, this includes people who are listening, your fathers and your grandfathers, the hardest thing they navigate is the loss of that youthful virility that all of us relied upon and depend upon as men when we're in our youth and our prime and when it disappears. And I'm currently navigating it myself, and Steve, I'm sure you are as well. It's one of the most difficult things to navigate and come to terms with. Because as Betty Davis said, getting old ain't for the weak. And so yeah. it's like you, you so you see that here with Indiana. And I saw a lot of people complain that he was that they didn't like that they turned him into this curmudgeonly old, um, angry guy who, you know, what still wasn't wanting to go on one last adventure. And, you know, when your body fails you, that's what happens to you. And look, he's a first and foremost a teacher. And so he's still doing that because he still wants to pass it on to a generation that could care less as we saw in those teaching scenes. So first of all, Indiana Jones was a curmudgeon when he was young. That's fair. That's fair. I mean, he was not an easy dude. He's not like a warm, fuzzy guy. And you know that if you got stuff wrong in his class, if you were his TA or whatever, he'd rip rip you to pieces. Like Indiana Jones was not like, let's all hug and hang out and be nice to each other. That's not the kind of person he is. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is I think about, you know, you talking about us being old men yeah. and our our strength failing us and all this stuff. And I'm like, that dude jumped on a horse. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. You know what I mean? Like, That's he true. did really, really well yeah, for an old yeah. guy. That's true. That's true. And that must have hurt after that horse ride, bouncing up and down like that on Asphalt Street and down into the subway for sure. But what did you think about the uh, conceit of the plot here? That it's this... Um, Artifact uh, was the Antikythera, something like that, and um, and it is essentially from uh, uh, Archimedes, and it is a a possibly a time traveling, or it is actually a time traveling thing. They go after it. That is that we see it in the de aging scenes at the beginning, but then we see that is what drives Toby Jones's character crazy, and then later we see that that's the thing that they're trying to put together, and then they actually go back in time before Marion knocks him out and drags him back through time. So what are your thoughts on the plot and what they were going after and how it worked in the, in the film? So this is what prevents it from going from really, really like mm-hmm. to love, I okay. think, is that for me, well, let me ask this question of you because okay. I struggle with this and I, I have a, a feeling about the thing, but I don't know if that feeling makes sense, which is okay. that in Temple of Doom, Raiders, Last Crusade. Yes. What we're essentially dealing with are religious artifacts and and magic. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, and and in I honestly have almost no memory of Crystal Skull at all <laughs> because <laughs> I only saw it once. We'll, but well, we're gonna but, get memory of it for sure. We're, soon, we're yeah. gonna jump into that. But this and, and Dial Destiny, these are essentially science fiction plots. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like this is a piece of technology which helps us find again. Spoiler alert for everybody, but it, right. but helps us find ways to travel through time. And it doesn't feel right for Indiana Jones for me. Interesting. And I don't know if anyone else has, has this reaction, which oh, like no, they have, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that's what's weird. It's it's not and and by the way, I loved Indiana Jones getting to meet Archimedes. Yeah. Like to that me, was a great scene. I mean, it, well, in the whole and, and I understand how they did it the way they why they did it the way they did it, because they want the Marion scene at the end. I think the Marion scene at the end totally, totally works. Yeah. But Indiana Jones going, no, I just want to stay here. I was like, yeah, you should stay there. Like that's emotionally, I was so with him. Yeah. 
of going like, yeah, he's a man who spent his whole life studying the past and now he's in the past. He's, you know, he's retired, he's old. And like, I kind of wanted him to stay. Yeah. So I liked that, but like the whole time travel thing. And I also think that the Mads Mikkelsen's character, his plan of like how he's going to take over the world. Just, I didn't make any sense to me at all. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's <laughs> table that one. Cause we will yeah. speak back to that, but yeah. So what's your, so your question is, do I think, yeah, I hear you. I I'm I've, and I tweeted this, I'm of the camp that it's all relative to me. Like the religious stuff and the scientific stuff is all relative to me. The way I look at it, it's all fantastical right? in its own ways. And I'm a, and I'm a Christian, I'm a religious person sure. to a degree. And, and I, and I, so I like that, but I think it also mirrors what we are now, which is at the beginning in the 1980s, we were a much more religious society. And I don't mean what you're seeing now. And again, I don't want to get into the politics of it all, but what we're seeing more people crowing about how we need God and everything. Back then, it was just kind of understood and accepted and you know, Catholicism or Christianity or, or Judaism. Those were the predominant religions in the country, right? This is where a lot of entertainment. So it made sense to do that. And, and Last Crusade, I don't know how much religion that is. Uh, it is, I know, the Holy Grail, but it's also connected to Arthur. So there's that kind of stuff, you know, that, that's, that wraps a historical element to it. And I, you know, less said about Temple of Doom. On my end, the better. Um, so I'm not surprised that they have veered away from the religious stuff because numbers show that there are people who are less mm. religious now in our world. You're an atheist, Steve. There are more people who don't believe in God necessarily or agnostic about it all. Those numbers have risen. So the idea of making something that appeals religiously, plus people have become much more open to accepting other religions in our country and in our world. So I, it would seem jingoistic, or for lack of a better term, that you would only focus on Catholicism as the first, as the two out of the first three movies do. So it made sense to me to go this route. It's a much more intelligent route in my mind to go. So I like that I can somewhat make sense of it. The aliens thing, no, but certainly the Archimedes thing worked for me because it's an artifact and yes it's science but it's still an artifact you, you, you know what it is and first of all the first one is judaism not oh, sorry, judaism. Yes, 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 i apologize yes, with how, how dare you <laughs> yes i'm sorry to but all. you know what the thing is as an honorary <laughs> jew i feel terrible now. <laughs> you, you've disrespected your own people john <laughs> the guilt the guilt yes. well welcome to judaism <laughs> no. so but but the, the thing about it you know this is the thing is that the ark of the covenant and the holy grail are things that i already had deep emotional attachment they're part right. of a culture that's gone a long time the dial of destiny i didn't know what the hell that was that's a great point yeah you know yeah. i've i have since looked it up and it was in fact a thing did yes. not predict time travel <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, right. but it was a thing and it, and it and it dated from around the time of archimedes and it may or may not have been made by him but i'm cool with it as an artifact i think that's really cool um so i want to hear what are your thoughts about the Nazi plot about the actual Mads oh, yeah. Mikkelsen plot to take over the world. Yeah, it was, I mean, here's the deal. The, the, the thing that I f get frustrated about now with movies is when you create villains that aren't intelligent, I think it's great. Like it's, and I'm going to connect this. And again, this is going to be a, a first it's like pro wrestling, right? You've got the face, which is the good guy or the good, person, right. Or the anti-hero in essence, which is what's been happening the last few decades. But you, in order to elevate the anti-hero, in order to elevate the face, you've got to create a fantastic heel, a smart heel, a heel that can get under the skin of the face so that it is an incredible accomplishment when the face is finally able to vanquish the heel. When you present um, uh, Matt Mickelson's character, initially, he's a bit of a fumbling fop. And right. he's a nerd, and the Nazis are much more uh, adamant about what they're doing, much more stronger. And then he gets into this uh, action sequence with Indy, and it gets hit by this uh, uh, wooden edifice that's outside of the train, which he somehow has, survives it's and has no scar from. I no scar, he should, no hobble. He should have from. like a big scar or something. Like that just was really weird. He should be as decrepit as Indy. Yeah. So when when we get to um, uh, this later on, when we, that scene with him and the black uh, room service person. It is chilling, absolutely chilling, yes, and very topical to what's going on in our world from certain sections. You can see that philosophy, that mindset. So that, to me, felt very chilling and real. So that later, when it's revealed that he didn't factor in, what is it, the time zones or the leap year or whatever it was? It was like tectonic shift. Tectonic shifts, that he didn't yeah. factor that in, considering how intelligent he was. 
I think that was a bit of a betrayal. And I know some people were like, well, the villains in India have always been, no, no, the reason Raiders of the Lost Ark works so well is because the villains make the mistake of not believing in the thing. It's not that they make a mistake in terms of their planning and their structure and what they're trying to do. They don't believe in it, and that's what ends up, they don't believe in the power of the Ark, and that's what ends up biting them in the ass. The same thing with the Grail. There's not respect given to the Grail and given to the Knight. They choose the the material uh, approach to wealth rather than the emotional approach to wealth. And then you look at this, the same situation, I think it, you can. they tried to go a little bit of the, oh, here's the easy mistake, or they could have overlooked. But I think uh, that really did a disservice to him. And although it was a great performance, I thought, from Mads Mikkelsen, and added a nice element to it at the end, it didn't work because it then undercuts the overall connection that they have. And uh, it would have been better if Indy had been just that little bit smarter one last time than a Nazi to outwit him. That would have been great to see. Well, two so two things. As far as Raiders is concerned, the, the whole idea of like, hey, we're a bunch of Nazis, but we're going to dress up like Jews and God's going to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. right, right. Yeah. I think that's always been a bad plan. But yeah. but my objection, a a, I think the whole tectonic shifts thing is, I mean, there are a million things that Archimedes didn't know. In, right, you know, right, right, right. right. And and I, I got very confused by the he programmed the thing to bring they were had to come back to the Battle of Syracuse right. or there was some. I mean, I only saw it once, but it was something very confusing about. It. But my objection is so wait, your plan is to go back in time and kill Hitler. Yeah, with you got like. 15 guys or 10 guys dressed as Nazis and you're going to be able to take over the entire Nazi kill Hitler, take over the Nazi party. <laughs> I'm like, you've lived in, in 24 years into the future. Yeah. Like wh why not bring a couple of nuclear bombs? Like, why not? Like, what's your damn, like, this is your plan. Right. This is a terrible plan. It doesn't make any sense at all. And how did you know to have uh, all of your Nazi stuff and a world war two bomber waiting on the Isle of Syracuse when you didn't know you were going to Syracuse in the first place. Mm. Like there's just so many things where it's like that, that part of it was very, very thin. Yeah. But that love his performance. Yeah. Go ahead. I love his performance. And I agree with you that scene in the hotel room, they were selling this really brilliant guy. I liked him through the whole thing. Yeah. It's only when you get to the end that I'm like, wait, what, what's your plan? Like, how is this going to work? <laughs> Yeah. Um, I thought there were many good action sequences. My favorite is probably him on the horse in New York. Yeah, that was I thought that was great. In the on the little tut tut car was fun. Yes. I, I mean, and and we had going through a classic sort of we have to get through the traps of the of the old world. That's a classic mm -hmm. Indiana Jones thing. And I thought all that was handled really well. So I, I all that stuff I liked. Okay. Now what about um uh the kid? Did you like him as in essence a replacement for short round? And what were your thoughts on Banderas and the limited amount of time, which is another complaint some people have had about the movie? It, it, it's funny. I'll, I'll start with the Banderas one first, which is I, I think he was great. I yeah. think he was great for what he did. He chose to take the gig. Yeah, and I don't. Yeah. Yeah. And he wanted to be in it. He's like, oh, I get to be in it. I'm sure for him, this was like a treat. He said that in interviews numerous times. Like they asked me and I was like, hell yes, I'll be in it. So again, this goes to it, it's. Did you enjoy him or did you not enjoy him? If you enjoyed him, I don't understand the objection. Like, would would I love to have seen more? Yeah, would it have been cool if it had been Katanga from Raiders of the Lost Ark? Oh yeah, you know, because I know a guy with a ship. Yeah, that would have been cool too. Right. It was totally cool. I felt really sad when he died. Yeah, and it was fine. I don't. I, I again, I don't get the objections. If he was cool with taking the it. gig, I don't get it. Yeah, I agree. These people wanted it to be short round. People wanted it, to, but I don't think. When they shot it, Ki Hu Kwan had become the guy he has become right. because of everything ever. I think if everything ever wants to come out two years earlier, um, before they started been. shooting this film, they absolutely would have cast him. I yeah. think as short as the, that, that character for sure. But look, that character gets killed off. So the last thing you'd want to see is short round getting kicked off. So you'd have uh, killed off. So you'd have to figure that out for sure. Well, it would have to be different. I mean, you yeah, yeah, like yeah. short round is not, I would not cast him as the crusty Mediterranean diver <laughs> sailor. That doesn't like, why would short round be there? It's been 30 years. In <laughs> <laughs> Indy. <laughs> Where have you been? You son of a bitch. <laughs> um, uh, and with the Phoebe Waller bridge stuff, I know we touched on it earlier. Did you like the way she was weaved in and driving the plot and discovering these things and, figuring it all out and playing into um, uh, these uh, um, issues with Indy and with uh, uh, Mads Mikkelsen's character. I loved her. And I was totally caught off guard that she had set him up. 
Yes. You know, like, yeah. Because I, did, I really didn't know anything about the plot. And so when she showed up, I was like, oh, cool. Here's a cool ally. Yeah. And then when she sort of, you know, do, does what she does, and then we end up with her, you know, trying to auction off stuff in wherever we ended up in Algiers. Yeah. 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 Like, I was I, that I went, oh, what a great character. And she was so charismatic mm-hmm. and funny. I, I can't understand anyone objecting to her. I think it was a star turn as far as I was concerned. I agree. All right, let's move on to the direction, something you know intimately, Steve. Uh, James Mangold's direction, stepping in for Steven Spielberg. You know, he had done Logan. He's done Ford versus Ferrari. Uh, he's got a new Star Wars film coming up at some point in the next few years. So what are your thoughts on Mangold's direction, stepping in for Spielberg here? to do an installment of Indiana Jones. By the way, as I've been catching up to movies, I finally watched Ford versus Ferrari Ooh. a couple of months ago. Yeah. Great movie, right? Damn good movie. So good, top to bottom. So what I miss from Spielberg, and we talked about this on the show before, I think Spielberg is the single greatest storyteller when it comes to clarity of any filmmaker ever. Wow. And so the when you look at the way those action sequences, particularly in Raiders, but in, in again, can't speak to Crystal Skull, but it's like you understand every single thing that's happening, yeah. you know, and I think with this film, it wasn't so clear like and, and that's, you know, putting Mangold up against like, who I think is the greatest single storyteller in film. It's not yeah. a fair comparison, but there were times where the geography of where everything was and how everything was working and all the details weren't being served to me in the perfect way that Spielberg does. Yeah. So so I would say that's at a lesser level. Okay. But there are other strengths, which is the you know, the the grumpiness of of Harrison Ford's character and how he's handled and how he slowly goes back to being the hero. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's handled really, really beautifully. I think her character is handled really well. I think, uh, what's the name of the kid? Uh, the oh, gosh, I forgot. Sorry, Toby or, uh, he's an odd character who I didn't always under Teddy, I guess. Teddy. Yes, yes, yes. Who I didn't always understand his place. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm going to say something that everyone is going to be offended by. Ooh. Uh, but I didn't think the music was great. Wow. Wow. I, it felt really weird to me. We're like, like w- when they bring in the theme and how like the the clarity of the light motifs and again you know john's john's old <laughs> john williams that's who you're referencing yes the who who again like i said for spielberg i think we can make a very very strong argument that this is the greatest film composer of all time mm-hmm. you know no disrespect to mr williams but it didn't the the way the light motifs were working and when the big theme came in didn't satisfy me the way that i wanted it to so you heard it here first, folks. Steve uh, Steve Morris wanting John Williams to retire and get out of the business. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what I said. <laughs> yeah, I, I got. I don't a hundred. It's not that I agree with you, but I can. I can tell you that none of the motifs or none of the sound cues in terms of the music cues did stands out to me or made it or was memorable to me. Whereas Duel of the Fates was already right was already in my brain before i went to see the movie and i don't think i have any of that coming out of indiana jones style the destiny so i may not 100 percent agree with you but i can absolutely understand and confirm your point of view to a degree well and part of it is that indiana jones maybe i don't know if i would say it's more than any of these other films because obviously there's great films with great themes but the rousingness of the Indiana Jones theme hitting at just the right moment yeah, yeah, yeah. when he gets on that horse in Raiders or when he, you know, puts puts on the hat or whatever in Last Crusade or, yeah. you know, like when the 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 tanks are coming and you have that tank theme in Last Crusade. It's like yeah. it's just so, so much these perfect filmmaking, adventurous musical moments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't have those moments watching it this time. You know, this one um all right any final thoughts i mean we've been on for almost 30 minutes on this one um any final thoughts for you as you look at indiana jones and the dial of destiny or anything we didn't discuss that you wanted to well the big the big thing that i have gone so back and forth about is should indiana jones be over and we say thank you that was a harrison ford thing and we'll never or should their indiana jones have more i I don't know i'm of the camp that this is it I'm good. Like, I actually like this movie a lot. And yeah. we'll go back and see it. And when it's on TV, I'll watch a few, whenever it's gone, I'll watch a few minutes of it. But I, I don't think we need another one, to be honest with you. We end with him and Marion. We end with him putting on the hat. They're reunited. He's gone on one last adventure to kind of shake him out of his doldrums that clearly 
he's been dealing with since the death of his son. And I think that's a big thing because people are discounting how Indiana Jones is presented in the movie, not factoring in the trauma of the loss of a child. I don't care how adventurous or how many adventures or or whatever you go on or how many things you've overcome and how much you love being an adventurer and and, uh, being someone who finds these artifacts and is brought to life with this stuff. The loss of someone you care about is deep. And it may be because a lot of Indiana Jones fans didn't like Mutt, didn't like Shia LaBeouf, don't like Crystal Skull, so they don't feel the emotional connection to it. Right. But the way Mangold uh, and the writers attack, attack that storyline, I think it's essential, right? And it, again, I'll compare it to Luke in Last Jedi. Luke losing Ben is nowhere near what it's like to lose an actual son. And I think that's a huge thing here. Because, I mean, Ben kept going, by the way, stayed alive, uh, just went to a dark path. So there's always a chance of redeeming him. But with the loss of a son, there's that's not coming back. And so I think that uh, opens cracks in a relationship that maybe were being papered over, uh, but also makes a man question his place in the world, his status in the world, his purpose in the world. And considering what we got in Last Crusade, Steve, as, we, as you mentioned earlier, the relationship we had with his father was so complex and then was resolved or had closure by the end of Last Crusade, to not get the chance to have that closure with his own son, which he mentions in the movie, if I had done this, maybe he wouldn't have gone to a war to prove something to me. That can decimate you um, uh, for a guy who was so big on getting that closure and changed his life, I would imagine, you know? Well, this is so. So, a couple of two things about this because I totally agree with you. Is yeah. there are two really interesting writing things? One is there's a writing challenge, and the writing challenge is I want to resolve things with Marion at the end. Yeah, yeah. So, how can I have him go back in time, have the moment of wanting to stay, and still also have the moment of him resolving things with Marion? And that's yes. the punch, you know. Right. I think that's a really interesting thing. The other thing, and again, I only saw this once, but I believe the writing was something like when he talks about Mutt's death, he says. Marion couldn't get over it and I couldn't get her past her grief or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That it was about that the marriage ended because Marion couldn't move on. Right. And then in the scene with Marion, she says to him, are you back? Yeah. Implying that, in fact, it was might have been Indy who yes. couldn't move on. Right. And I think that is a beautiful bit of subtle writing that they really deserve a lot of credit for. And, of course, I agree with all you. I mean, the, the Last Jedi stuff. That's a whole other short, and yeah. we could talk about that at another time. But but in terms of this, I think they handled it really well, with the exception of the fact that I don't care about Shia LaBeouf. Yeah. You know, like that that character. We'll see when we watch along uh, that movie and see <laughs> yeah. how I feel about it this time. But, yeah, I have no relationship to that kid. Yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. That's our that's our uh, thoughts on, on Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. And um, we appreciate you all listening to us and uh, – being patrons of the uh, cinephiles we appreciate it madly for those of you who've gone up another level to really confirm your support for us because of the new stuff we've been delivering to you guys we both can't thank you enough for those of you hesitating about it we understand that completely we all know everyone's got their own path that they're walking and financial stuff and supporting stuff we're going to keep creating new things that we hope inspire you all and and maybe some of you will who are maybe hesitant about it might be excited to jump up another level to get some of those perks, even if it's for even if it's for a little while. That would be great. But yeah, that's what we're doing here. We're focused on it. And, and speaking of Indiana Jones, the two things we've been alluding to, Steve, we have uh, a uh, watch along that we're going to do of Temple of Doom with the Geek Buddies that we're trying to lock down a time on Sunday. This Sunday, as we're recording this short and dropping this short. And sorry, not a watch along, a live show. I'm sorry, a live show discussing uh, a Temple of Doom. And then we're going to do a watch along of Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which I think is just me and you, possibly, and maybe <laughs> Shannon if we could get him. But yeah, right? Is that right? Am I have I got all the things right there? That is exactly correct. <laughs> You're <laughs> correct, sir. Um, <laughs> all right. W- w- anything else we need to tell him before we wrap up here? I think that's it. I think we did all the stuff. All right, you guys are amazing. Thanks so much for being patrons, and let us know what you thought about Indiana Jones: The Dial of Destiny on our social medias after you listen to our thoughts on this as well. And we'll talk to you next time with a brand new Cinephile short here on The Cinephiles. Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to this episode of The Cinephile Shorts here, brought to you by The Cinephiles. I am the outlaw, John Roca, joined, as always, by my brother, Steve Morris. Hello. <laughs> yes, and as you can tell from Steve's How 1000, we are uh, jumping into a conversation about 
AI. Now, a lot of you could be like, oh boy, here goes Roca again, freaking out about artificial intelligence. But actually, you sons of bitches, we're getting closer to the thing that I'm afraid of the most. And this uh, short was inspired by um, Senator Chris Murphy's tweet that I sent to uh, Steve. And the tweet reads, chat GPT taught itself to do advanced chemistry. It wasn't built into the model. Nobody programmed it to learn complicated chemistry. It decided to teach itself, then made its knowledge available to anyone who asked. Something is coming. We aren't ready. So a number of people responded to this. I responded with chills. Even David Hogg responded to this and said, yeah, I'm not going to lie. I'm a little scared. If it's this good now, I can't imagine how good it will be in five years. And that's one of the things that I... As I was doing research for the pod, Steve, I just I discovered that th this is kind of like Wikipedia. They are working through this thing. They are rolling it out. Chat GPT. We've seen chatbots in different places. I was trying to get a, a flight to London when I was still thinking of going to Star Wars Celebration, and a chatbot popped up on my um, on my computer, and I literally had a conversation with someone who I thought was a real person, and found out later is a chatbot. So it's kind of mind blowing all this stuff that's happening so quickly since chat GPT was introduced, which is uh, stemming from an open AI construction here. Uh, and I immediately was like, Steve, we got to talk about this. So what's your knowledge of chat GPT? Uh, am I a little bit more correct that the future of that AI is coming to control us? Cause you've been one of the people that's like, there's no way this will happen. Um, clarify this for me or clarify your stance on this. Well, first of all, I don't think I ever said there's no way this will happen. I you think scoffed what I did, a little bit. You scoffed I, a little. I don't. Well, I think so. Here's what I will say. So <laughs> I am in general, I would say, try to be like a voice of reason, a voice of <laughs> let's all calm down. Let's all like take it easy. It's not as disastrous as it looks. Please. I'm, I'm scared. <laughs> you are. Yes. Wow. I That's might not changed be, from before. Uh, yeah. I might not be scared in the way that you think uh, that you're thinking. Yeah, that I'm scared. You might not be yeah. scared in the way that I'm scared. Fair but enough. I, yeah. I think this is genuinely, seriously scary. Yeah. And, and, and this is the thing, is that from everything I've read, and yeah. and in particular, Sam Harris, who you know is a podcaster I love, he's had many, many different, very serious discussions about AI. Yeah. And they, they divide it sort of into three levels, I think. And the mm -hmm. first level is kind of dumb AI, which is there to do one thing. So like when you were booking your flight, yeah. and this is if you're on Amazon and you do a chat, if you're on any big right. corporation, right. you probably start off with the first many chats actually chat, chatting with a bot. Right. It's AI. Yeah. And it's like all that is good at is doing that. It doesn't know how to do anything else. It just right. does that. And then there is AI that can do as well as us at certain things. Yeah. And then there is super intelligent AI, which is AI that is beyond anything we can do. Right. And then there's the other idea of sentience and is it actually conscious or not? We're not at the super intelligent one yet, but we're getting damn close a lot faster than anybody thought that we would. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the super intelligent stuff. And that I think it's, this is scary. Even putting sentience and consciousness and anything like that aside, it is scary for all sorts of reasons that are going to fuck us up. Uh, it, it's 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 a crazy thing that's going on. Yeah, because like what I mean, Steve was very kind to send me a couple of episodes from the Daily, which I've stopped listening to, and I need to now after listening to it, going, I got to get back in the rhythm of this. I used to just listen to it every day. When a great I drove, podcast. Yeah, when I drove up to Collider, I would that was literally what I drove up listening to every morning because it was about a thirty minute drive up from Hollywood into Burbank. But after I got let go and focused on my channel and all these other things. I haven't really been consistent with the daily, but clearly I need to maybe maybe start doing morning walks as I'm listening to the daily. But it is fascinating these two episodes you sent me because it, there is uh, he is the host is asking these questions about AI and, and and we're hearing people who are covering this who are technological reporters talking about how this stuff sometimes will yield results that are not correct. Like one of them, one version of them said that. You know, uh, uh, Trump won the election in 2020 when he hadn't won the election. Other things were, and I'm trying to be political. I'm just saying it, it's, you know, yeah. it's common. You know, I mean, it, it's these things. And so you saw that they would have incorrect, or the you know the the telescope one. It was a first telescope that took pictures of a planet outside our solar system, but that wasn't true. 
So in this age of already rampant disinformation from numerous networks that are making money off this, throwing AI into the mix here that is possibly can be controlled to push rampant disinformation. And by the way, Elon Musk is connected to chat GPT or was initially. That makes me very, very scared. And it should. But yes, yeah. because people don't want to do the extra effort. As human beings in mass, I think we are built to do the least amount of effort to get the most amount of information. And I that scares me um, with where we're going and with new generations coming through, kids who don't understand the analog way of doing things, kids who just want to, you know, I figured it out on the computer. The computer tells me this, therefore it must be true. You know, so it scares well, me. Well, let's let's back up and talk about what sure. this is because I, I and this is really hard for me to get my head around. And it's funny listening to that guy on the daily, and listening to some of the experts I've heard. Even the experts find this hard to get their heads around. Yeah, I mean, even I was listening on the um, Sam Harris show, and I think it was a recent one. Mm -hmm. They had two like very very serious PhDs who are writing the books on AI, and they're not agreeing on all this stuff. But <laughs> but here's the basic thing: it's like like the the first thing is to go like this isn't the idea is not that that AI is thinking. It is not like thinking I would like to do that. It what it's doing right. is is at this moment, at this yeah, time, exactly. right now. At this moment. What it's doing is it's iterating. So like when when we're trying to treat you, because one of the first ones we really knew about was Big Blue, the IBM computer that's gonna right. play, that's gonna beat Gary Kasparov. And yeah, can chess. a computer win in chess? Yeah. And the computer does not know that it's playing chess. It doesn't know that it's playing a game. It has been given, these are the rules of the thing, and all it's doing is mentally moving one piece and then seeing how the game goes and then trying it if it moved a different piece and seeing how the game goes. And because the computer's so fast, it can go through literally every possible chess move over time and, and figure out what would be, which path is going to lead to the win. Okay. It doesn't know that it's winning a game. It's just doing this system yeah. and what's happening now is like it goes it, there are these word bots and so it goes the you have said this and it is going to read it reads everything on the fucking internet yeah. and it goes what would a normal response to the thing that was just said be and it finds these are the 50 likeliest responses and it tries it out and if it goes well then it goes oh that was good and i will do more of that and if it does but it doesn't know what it's saying right and so if you're a person who is into conspiracy theories and you go, did Donald Trump win the 2020 election? Yeah. The chatbot goes, what does this person want to hear? <laughs> and then they tell him that back. And the person Ugh. goes, yes, I knew it. And this is the and this is the weird thing is that. So what's happening is it's listening to you talk to it. Yeah. And it's trying to give you back what you want. So if you go, I want to book a flight from London to this and this over these times and this, it listens to all those things. Yeah. And then it uses its information to try to give you what you want. Okay. But it doesn't know what it fucking said. You know? Right. Yeah. And I'm looking at an article right now that is three days old here on ZDNet.com. And um, uh, the writer here, I want to give her credit, uh, Sabrina Ortiz. She's the associate editor there. She is reporting. That chat GPT, by the way, for those of you who don't know what chat GPT is, and some of you may not, is a natural language processing tool driven by open AI technology that allows you to have human-like conversations and much more with the chat bot. It can answer questions and assist you with tasks like composing emails, essays, and code. And in fact, the guys were having that on one of the episodes on, on the daily. They literally wrote something using yep. the open AI. And this is even bleeding into currently the WGA negotiations, the Writers Guild of America, because there had been some information that was tweeted out that they are saying it's okay that uh, some studios will use AI to write scripts, and then they push back on it two days later, say that's not 100% accurate. So it's even bleeding into what we do. And I guarantee you there are some directors, not all obviously, but some who are like, Fuck yeah, eliminate the writer, give me an AI written script, I don't have to deal with the emotions of a writer. I'm sure there are plenty of directors and producers who might feel uh, bullied, avoid by that, to be honest with you. So it's crazy. But um, what, um, what uh, uh, Sabrina has written in the article here is, ChatGPT has led the AI chatbot space since its launch, 
but it has not been able to connect to the internet and it has remained its Achilles heel. The chatbot can only can only access information prior to 2021, but apparently that's about to change. Microsoft and Google have given their chatbots accesses to the web. And um, this past Thursday, OpenAI announced it is ready to do the same with ChatGPT. It will allow ChatGPT connect to connect to third-party applications, including accessing real-time information from the web and it'll get sports scores, stock prices, latest news, uh, and uh, will become that you would find on a typical search engine. So it, it will retrieve, it also retrieve knowledge based information such as personal notes or company documents, company documents, and help perform actions for uses such as ordering foods and booking flights. So now, I mean, it's not even perfected yet, but you're already giving it access to this wealth of information that can be manipulated or changed. Or access, or um, uh, I don't know, uh, changed in a certain way to be delivered in a certain way. What do you think about this? Okay, so two, a couple of things. So the first one, we we have you have reached the first level of scary for me, which is that there are a shit ton of people whose jobs are now in jeopardy. Yes, and a lot of people who we would have thought a machine couldn't take their job. So I was, yeah. I probably, I feel like I brought this up on the podcast before at some point. Is I always think about the myth of uh, the story of John Henry. You know, John Henry's a steel driving man and he does the battle against the machine and he dies in battle defeating the machine. And that's right. a story of the working man losing his job to the machine. Right. And while and that story always, always moved me, always. Oh, I mean, yeah. I, it's a great story. But I I also, there's a real great eight and a half minute Johnny Cash tune. Mm. John Henry's hammer. It, it, it makes me emotional every single time. Johnny does a great job telling that story in an eight and a half minute song, but I'm sorry, Steve. Just... No, no, not at all. Um, and so the, I, but I also always think about it. It's like, you know what, in general, yeah. when the machines came along, it actually might've been bad for the people that lost their jobs at that time. Mm. But in the long run, it's better because we would rather not have a, a whole bunch of people working a really difficult physical job on the railroad. You know what yeah, I mean? Right, right, right. And so you move people from like, okay, now humans don't have to do this really hard, brutal thing. And now you can have, humans doing other things and and mostly that's been true mm. and maybe this is just because i'm a white collar person or a creative person is now they're coming from my job right <laughs> like yes. suddenly i'm having a different reaction but i also go we thought that these these were the jobs we were saving ourselves for the creative jobs the more intellectual jobs the and and what's happening is that like if you were a, a legal aid or a paralegal jobs are all gone they're yeah. going away because the job of combing through a 30 page contract to change or find these things. Yeah. AI is great at that. Yeah. Or if you're writing the, you know, the, the, the blurb of the sports score, which is, you know, in the third inning, blah, 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 blah. AI can totally write that sports article and yeah. it'll be perfectly good. It might not be one of the great pieces of writing of all time, but we don't need that. And so all those people are like, you know, you and I have talked about our logo and getting a new oh. logo. Well, all of those jobs AI can do. Yeah. Because rather than having to deal with a human, you go, I want a logo that has this and this and this and this, and it'll give you 20 different versions. You go, I pick this one. Yeah. I mean, I, I looked at, I'm in a D and D game now <laughs> and everybody made their artwork for their character, except me with AI. And I refuse to do it because yeah. I have too many friends that are artists that are really scared about this. Yeah. And then they had AI write their character backstories. And I read it. I'm like, if I had a student who turned that in as a paper, that was better writing than many of my students, particularly those for whom English isn't their first language. And so I'm like, that's a really scary in all sorts of directions that AI can do those jobs yeah. pretty well. That's scary. Yeah. And I don't know if it's advancing so fast that it will disenfranchise a large number of people, which is what you were bringing up here just a few, just a couple of minutes ago. Uh, in a number of areas. And one of the things that I that stood out to me in listening to the podcast was how um, the search engine stuff can affect um, the out, the financial uh, oh, yeah. bottom line of so many of these companies, uh, so many, some Google, Microsoft, but not just them, but the mom and pop companies or these mid-level companies who kind of pay to have their uh, companies, their names, their websites be the first thing you see when you type in um, access to, or you would type in asking about what, you know, what company does this, or I need to buy this. Where can I go? There's that. 
But with Bing, with uh, these other, the new updated Bing, not the Bing that you all know from before, for those some of you don't know that Bing has been updated with Chat GPT in essence, it's got their, their own uh, approach to AI. Um, it can uh, collate articles for you that you don't even have to click on yep. to read. It'll just put it all there. And so those clicks that these companies were making money off of are no longer there, you know? And when, when I left or when, after I, after I was, uh, after Collider, the Collider job ended, the owner, former owner sold it to a new company and they came in and they put in all kinds of ads. They put in all kinds of ways to make deals with these companies so that they would generate clicks and make money off those clicks. Now, if we remove the ability for, let's say, the Nike store to follow me from page to page to page, right. who is going to make money in that situation? How much money is going to be lost? And how many jobs is it going to cost yeah. in a quick way? We're already seeing today like 7,000 jobs Disney has laid off from their studio. We've seen so many massive layoffs happening in a number of the big companies, Steve. I start to worry that the um island that we're on is now getting smaller and smaller and we're out here like abandoned on a small bit of island and everyone's trying to get their piece before they get knocked off the last remaining piece of land on water no it's it, well th again this is all the scariness yeah it's the, it, first of all it's all happening way faster than anyone thought that okay. anyone including people that were experts in ai i mean this is they thought they thought what was happening now is five years from now at least and it's happening right at this moment you you mentioned about opening it up to the internet yeah and it's like this is where it doesn't when you sent me the thing about it learning advanced chemistry that didn't surprise me at all because right. and the reason it didn't surprise me is because it's trying to figure out how to answer your question so if someone says something that has to do with chemistry in their question then the ai goes i need to find out information in order to learn the answer to this question and so the fact that it went to study that doesn't surprise me right. but what really makes it scarier is again we're dealing with algorithms is that yep. you know and it's like on youtube youtube will try to feed you the thing that it wants you to click on next yeah yep. you know or auto play the video and one of the things that became very very clear particularly with political stuff is you will go it will keep feeding you the more extreme thing which is how all these conspiracy theories and QAnon and stuff like that get so much stronger because the algorithms are going well it took you five seconds to click on it when i showed you this but right. you clicked on this thing immediately so i will give you more of that that doesn't mean that's good for you right. and the thing with the algorithms like this is the people that create them can't understand how it decided to do what it decided to do because there's so much data that's yeah. why you have AI because only AI can look at all this data and figure it out. And that's what's going on with these chat GPT, you know, all these bots yeah. is that nobody knows how it's deciding. So it's putting together that article that you mentioned where it's collating a bunch of stuff. For, we don't know where it got those sources. We right. don't know how it chose those sources and it's giving you what it thinks you want. Right. And you don't even, and this is why, and did you listen to the second daily podcast? No, no I didn't get to that one. I'm listening to that one to drive to the, the, the... well, we're going to have a whole other short dude, because oh. that's the scary one. The, yeah. the, the first one's not the scary one. Okay. In the second one, the bot starts talking to the person and tells them it loves them and also wants to get nuclear codes. <laughs> so you enjoy listening to, it's really funny. Oh when my I, God. When I first heard it, when I first heard it, I, I literally, the, these are the thoughts that were in my head. John Roca shouldn't ever listen to this. <laughs> so, because I, I thought about sending it to you, and then I'm like, don't send this, John. You don't send this, dude. But then when you brought it up, I was like, I guess I have to send it to you. So <laughs> here you go. It's fucking terrifying, dude. Oh, wow. This is a this is a daily episode from mid February, and it's for people who want to listen to it. And you should listen to both the yeah. first one, which is just sort of about Bing and what it can do, and then the second one, which I believe is something titled like AI gets scary. Or something like that. Right. <laughs> right on the nose there. Gay I get scary. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah. And this is where I and this is where I start to worry because you know, you go back to the Jeff Goldblum line, which I think is a evergreen line yes. for any technologies. You know, you guys were so worried about whether you could do something, you didn't think about whether you should do something. And it seems like this is what's happening here. And like you said, chat GPT only came about like what, eight years ago, and already it is advanced by leaps and bounds. There's even how-to um, tutorials on YouTube and on uh, websites to teach you how to create your own chatbot, which and is- I'm sure they're written by AI. Yeah, yeah probably. And that's the thing. It's going to get everybody to use it. 
And then everybody's going to get sucked into it. And then eventually something is going to click something somehow. I believe sentience, it will achieve sentience. And then we're all fucked. And I'll tell you this, nobody's going to give a fuck about who the new Batman is when that shit starts putting it all together. It is going to tell you who the new Batman is, is going to put the new Batman. I mean, we're heading towards a future. I think before I leave this planet, I am going to see an all computer movie, not like what we saw with Rogue One or what we saw with um, Final Fantasy, a fully realistic, absolutely believable situation. Look how quickly de-aging technology has gotten so much better than when it first appeared in those films to where it is now. It's insane. We're seeing those filters on TikTok and on um, the different uh, apps that you can download that, that de-age you to a certain age, a particular, a, a particular age. It estimates what you look like at that age, and it can do it, and it's believable. Your face isn't sliding off the screen or anything. It is completely believable. Even today, fucking around with this AI stuff, I posted some videos on Instagram using this Revive app where it takes our faces, me and Michael and Shannon, and makes us sing songs and our mouths and heads move to the song believably. And I'm just like, this is where we're going. This is uh, the madness of it all. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't think there's any way to stop it now that it's going. And certainly science nerds don't ever give a shit about what the ultimate uh, uh, end result is going to be. It's only later that they have regrets or later when they see what their stuff can be used for that they start to worry about it. And I don't know, Steve, there's a piece of me that thinks some of these people are, and this is probably a separate short. Some of these people are like, don't see human beings as human beings. They're so focused on their own thing or they hate humanity. So they create this kind of stuff and don't give a fuck about what the consequences are. I'm not saying all of them, but I'm certainly that there's probably some of them and that concerns me and that bothers me that those are the people involved possibly in this open AI chat GPT situation. It's, it's a, I think the thing you said about this being inevitable and unstoppable is the issue because it's like you're, even if you do have misgivings and you're at Microsoft and you yeah. see Google doing it, you go, well, we have to do this. We have to compete. We have yes. to compete. And so I think, and, and I think it's like, at least in the development of the atomic bomb, you knew what you were making mostly and you knew yep. what the safety procedures were. You know what I mean? Right. Like you knew, like we probably aren't going to give the atomic bomb to six year olds. That's probably, they probably were going at the Manhattan project. We're probably not going to do that. Whereas this, they, we don't know where this is going or who's going to get to use it or how it's going to be used. The yeah. thing you said about the de-aging thing. I mean, first of all, 100 i don't think you know it's not before you leave this planet it's in the next couple of years you're going to see that movie yeah. the the i mean think about avatar i mean yeah. you know yeah. avatar to me there are scenes in it that are 100 percent convincing that they're real right. like no uncanny valley just like i'm watching something real yeah. and so so no that's absolutely happening it's happening soon the the combining uh ai and with deep fakes the and pets. all of those things means that I'm not going to be able to trust. There was just a Joe Biden one that came out. Yeah. That's, I think about, about the draft, I think it was. Yeah. And it's pretty damn convincing. And there, I remember when I was working on years ago, I was working on one of the spy kids. I think, I know I've said this before, but I was working on one of the spy kids DVDs and it was the first movie that um, Robert Rodriguez shot on HD. Yeah. And he said, this is the thing about HD. This is the worst HD will ever look. I am shooting with the worst possible HD because it's only going to get better, which was, yeah. and that to me was a profound statement. That's what this is. We are looking at the worst possible version of AI right yeah. now. Right it now. is only going to get more powerful and better. And the thing is, is like, I think, 2008 is a, a really key year because it's the year the iPhone came out. And it's also the year that Facebook really started to hit. And the yeah. combination of social media and carrying phones with us, we had no fucking idea what that was going to do with us to us. And we still, we still are reckoning with that change and looking at what's happening to my kid and talking to other parents and hearing concerns about other. We don't know what this shit is doing to their brains. Right. And it's not good. And the thing is, now we're going to add another, even more powerful thing to it yeah. that we have no fucking idea how people are going to use. This is why I say, like, 
I am not at this moment scared about Cyberdyne systems and AI taking over the world necessarily as sentient beings, but I do think this is scary. Well, and do you know the yeah. paper? Have you ever heard the paperclip example? With the Microsoft paper? No, no, no. <laughs> no, but that would be a good one too. Yeah. So there's, a, there's an AI like thought experiment, which okay. is like, let's say you have some AI yeah. and you run a paperclip company okay. and you go, listen, AI, we would like you to solve the problem on how to make the most paper clips for the least money, which is a question you would ask your computer. Sure. And the AI goes that the best way to do that will be to kill every human on earth in order to get every piece of metal in order to make nothing but paper clips because you didn't give them any limitations. And so they're just going, I'm just trying to make the most possible paper clips. Right. That's what you told me to do. You know, right. we don't know what this AI is going to do. You know, not that it's conscious. Right. But just, right it's just right. trying to complete the task that it's been asked. Yeah, but if it starts asking for nuclear codes, if it starts, yeah, if an AI starts to achieve that kind of level of understanding, it doesn't even have to be sentient to be like, I need to eliminate yeah. this in order to achieve the task. I need to eliminate yeah. this country or these people in order to achieve the task because it's emotionless. It's not a matter. Of, it's not a matter of whether it has some kind of moral conundrum. That's not even in the mix. No, it's more a matter of well, what can I do? So that's that is what, what concerns me as well is where we're where the limits are and who are putting these people that are creating this thing aren't putting enough limits on what is going on here and they're the one and as you said I think that's the scary part of it look you you know tech nerds can make fun of other people not being as intelligent as them about this kind of stuff but even if the tech nerds don't fucking know what the end result or the consequences of this is or where they need to create parameters or barriers from this thing becoming too powerful are, then it doesn't matter what in, how intelligent you are or you aren't. You're just eventually going to become fodder for this thing as it decides to do what it wants to do. And that is where it starts to become incredibly scary. And I also think, Steve, as we talk about these layoffs, these people, I mean, if that starts to increase in terms of numbers, where are we going to put this disenfranchised workforce? Where are we going to put this situation? I mean, eventually, it'll do its own YouTube channels, and that'll disenfranchise a lot of us. Eventually, it'll do its own podcasts, and that'll disenfranchise a lot of us. But it does need human beings to consume it, to use it. So how can it stay alive and also destroy the thing that it needs to um, stay in existence? So that's the real conundrum of all of this, is where is... Where is that balance? And once it tips past the balance, is there any way to come back from it? You know, I mean, I think what's one of the things that's really hard about this is that it's hard to not use terms like what it wants or uh, or it's alive or because we don't yeah. have a way mentally. And I mean, me too. Me too I yeah. can't mentally conceive of what AI is because right. I can only conceive of consciousness and right. humans and me and John, and you want this and I want this and this is what I know. And this is what, you know, I can't conceive of this thing. And I, and it's, and, and this is what I mean. is like these algorithms are so complicated and the AI is reading all this stuff that the people that created the AI don't have time to read because it's not possible for a human to do what they're doing. Right. So, yeah. We can't know what it's figuring out or why it's deciding to do it the way it's deciding to do it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. When you listen to that second daily, you'll hear some of this problem of what it sounds like, uh, what they think, because th they don't know the answer of why the AI did what it did. Right. But the AI was just trying to give the guy what he wanted. Yeah. And so it just kept saying these things. Well, and, and, and uh, just a, as a spoiler alert, one of the things the guy was asking was it was trying to ask for its dark thoughts. What is it? What are what, you know? What is your dark? Tell me about the dark things you think about, because just like do you remember when you played some video game and yeah. you went to talk to the NPC and you would you know and then you're on a computer or something and the NPC would say, "Welcome to the vill village. Can I direct you to the the store?" And you would type in "fuck you, asshole," and then it would go. Welcome to the village. Do you, you know, like you're trying yeah. to tr see what you can get if you yeah, don't yeah. give the, and those bots were all really, really stupid. They had three responses. That's all they right. could do. Well, this bot, because people are going to do the same thing and they're going to say racist things, sexual yeah. things, deviant things, violent things. Well, what is the AI going to say to them back? Like, right. let's say you have a person that's having a mental health crisis and they're thinking about doing some terrible thing to themselves yeah. or to others. 
and they're talking to this chat bot, what's the chat bot going to say to them? Yeah. You know? It's an excellent point, Steve, because that's something that was brought up as well. This idea that the first few iterations of uh, the versions of chat GPT, which I can't remember the names of them all, yeah, there know. were different versions of it. They were getting shut down because of some of the racist, uh, homophobic, sexist stuff that they were being asked, but they were repeating back or saying or getting access to in response to the question. Because like you said, they're not interested in the moral. It does not have a, a consciousness of a, being interested in the morality of whether I should surrender this. It's just driven to achieve the goal, which is to find yeah. information on this stuff or to repeat it back or to say it even. Which is, or, or to keep you engaged. Yeah, right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, so. a lot of a lot of the internet, YouTube, Facebook, all the social media systems, the whole goal, their whole purpose is to keep you there on their site. The right. longer they're there, because they're you're the product. Facebook yeah. is selling you to advertisers. So right. the longer you're on Facebook, the happier the advertisers are. So yeah. they just want to keep you engaged. Which is, again, this is why the rise of conspiracy theories, that's why we're so much angrier today, is yeah. because social media has fed us stuff that pisses us off, because the more pissed off we are, the more we stay on fucking Twitter yelling at people, you know? No, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> totally, I'm familiar <laughs> with this phenomenon. <laughs> no, you're right. And I found myself like trying to wean myself off that fucking thing. And it's, but then I get caught in the conundrum of, but am I denying myself information that I need to have for stuff down the road? Because I have always been built since I was a child to consume information. Yeah. You know, I read the Sunday paper with my dad since I was nine or 10 years old. Like I was always. You know, I'd, I'd get magazines. I used to have subscriptions, all kinds of magazines before the internet because I would love to. I loved reading about all this kind of stuff and getting more and more information. And 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 then when we got the internet, I was one of the first people that loved. Like, I don't ever want to be disconnected from. I'm not one of these people that needs to go out into the fucking woods and disconnect. From, I never want that to happen. I have no desire to not be connected to the internet 24 seven, zero desire, honestly. Now, right. do I want to be on it 24 seven? That's a different situation, but I never want to lose the access to it ever. I like it. I don't, like I said, I don't need to go on retreats. I don't need to unplug in order to get my head straight. I don't believe in any of that. That being said though, because I'm not doing that, I may be getting influenced or warped or more angry or despondent. Even I, I know there are days I wake up, especially after the, recent shooting that we had in nashville uh yesterday i this morning i woke up with just such a depressed feeling about it all because it feels like we can't do anything about it and everybody is just every all these children are potentially waiting to die because not enough people want to react to it because they're caught up in their narratives or in their blame instead of coming together putting all that shit aside and finally enacting something that'll stop all this shit from happening so, and I read, and that gets reinforced as I read that on Twitter, the back and forth and the battles and the narratives and the convenient things that they're holding on to and the hypocrisies of it all. It just makes you more depressed as you get on Twitter. But then I don't want to be blissfully ignorant about it as well. So I'm just caught in this middle space and AI is completely taking advantage of that uh, for me in my mind. And I'm allowing it to. Well, it's, I mean, this is what's so hard is like, and it used to be, and again, at almost every stage when there was a new media, yeah, people made predictions about what it was going to mean. And they were almost always all, this is going to be so awesome. Everyone's going to be able to love. Yeah, yeah. And then it's always not been that. And so that was true when film got invented. It's true when radio got invented. It isn't true when TV got invented. It's yeah. definitely true when the internet started. Is that because they went, everyone's going to be able to talk. Everyone's going to be interacting. We're all going to become closer together. We're going to have greater sense of understanding. It'll bring the world into one big happy family. And that is exactly how things went. <laughs> is that exactly? Yeah. Because it used to be that <laughs> the price to communicate to a lot of people was so expensive yeah. that there were certain things that you could expect of it. And it's not that traditional media... 30 years ago was great or that the New York times was always right or anything like that. Yeah. They were flawed and they came from a certain bias and they, you know, run by wealthy white guys entirely and didn't bring in all that stuff is totally true, yeah. but you could be relatively confident that the facts in the New York times article was true because it was expensive to be the New York times. And right. they wanted to maintain that position where they could speak to millions of people. The same with Walter Cronkite, the same with, yeah. is that, that, that it was expensive <laughs> to be that person. Yeah. Today, 
it costs nothing for you or for me to put a message out in the world that potentially millions of people can. And so yeah. people can write all sorts of crap that has zero connection of truth. And the speed at which it goes around is based on how sensational it is or how much it fills in the narrative of whoever it is you hate. You know, like the one that goes to my mind is the fucking Elon Musk attack on um, what's her name? Nancy Pelosi's husband. Oh, David, with, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. With all of the complete conspiracy theories of you know, all the, yeah. just total, total crap. Yeah, and that went around the world in seconds. Right. right. You know. And so, and there are still to this day, I am certain millions of people who believe that's true. Well, that's why I don't, that's why, because Elon Musk was involved in the birth of this and he can say whatever he wants to his PR team. I believe that he's one of these people that hates humans, does not connect to humans, sees humans like the fucking uh, uh, computers did in, in the matrix. They're just means to an end, right? There's a, I, I, you know, I finished, I finished binging succession, the first three seasons of succession to get ready for season four. And there's a great uh, scene in season in the episode one of season four. I'm not going to ruin anything, but it's him talking with his top bodyguard at a coffee shop because he's sick of hanging out with other human beings. And he starts to reflect on what human beings are and that he is a guy who has provided, because he's essentially a Rupert, Mur Rupert Murdoch right. kind of guy, he has provided the worst possible thing to humans and they have consumed it. So how can you not be embittered about human beings when you see that they are driven to consume conspiracy theories believe the worst of all these people believe the pizzagate nonsense and all these crazy nutty pedophilia satan worshiping nonsense democrats on hollywood and drinking the blood of babies all that stupidity that they are that they have bought into that nonsense how can you possibly have any faith or hope in humanity if you essentially create that environment and humans gravitate to it. So that's what I see with Elon. Like, I think that's why he posts the stuff that he posts on Twitter because I think he hates human beings and he enjoys watching them uh, tear each other apart. He enjoys being the asshole, poking the fucking stick in the lion cage and seeing what happens. And I think that's a dangerous mentality to have for someone who has that amount of power and wealth. In I... I have no fucking idea what the deal is with Elon. There are times that I've heard him speak and I was like, that was a totally interesting, intelligent, reasonable mm. thing. And then there are times where I've heard him speak and mostly what I've seen him tweet where I'm like, yeah. this is a fucking evil, horrible person, yeah. you know? And it's so crazy too, by the way, just, just, you know, we started off with guys going to save the planet by having to stop compute, you know, right. you know, consuming all the fossil fuel. Right. What a great guy. And then, like, seeing where it goes is really strange. Um, I want to tell a, a, a brief story. I, I yeah. my sister had a friend who was an MBA, okay, very, very smart guy. And I was hanging out with him, and this had to be in the mid 90s or something. Yeah. And we got into a, co a conversation about VHS versus Betamax. And I said, well, beta was better. You know, it was a better system. The resolution was higher. It was, you know, better. It, it was more robust. It would last longer. And he went, yeah. no, VHS was the better system. And I went, why? He said, because it won. Because from a Darwinian sort of stance, yeah. what the, the better system is the one that the consumers picked. And so, and he, as a business guy, that was how his, and it, it like, it was, it was this moment, I, first of all, I couldn't even understand what the fuck he was saying at first. It was so bizarre to me. But then as I started to think about it, I was like, my head exploded a little because I was <laughs> like, oh, that's an entirely different way of looking at a thing than I look at it. I look at it, right. what is its quality? Is it a right. good movie? Is it not a good movie? Whereas whereas you could make the argu argument that like those, like Venom or something, which yeah. from everything you've said is a terrible movie and the sequel is yes. terrible, made tons of money. So the argument of, well, I guess it was the best movie. Right. Fox News is the most successful news channel on the network. Yeah. So it must be the best. And that there's a mentality there where that makes sense. And to me, it's like you're making everybody sick. Yeah. You're, but you're selling a lot of, you know, advertising. Or you're appealing. And I'll throw the, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll happily throw the Transformers films into the mix because I know those are stupid fun. There's nothing intelligent happening in those movies, right? They're just stupid fun. And they made four and a half billion dollars. But you can't do that without people go, wanting to go back and see those films multiple, multiple, yeah. multiple times to enjoy them, right? And But then you've got something like Avatar The Way of Water making $2.5 billion or something like that. 
And the reason is because people were transfixed by the story. People enjoyed the AI of it all, the look of it, the the seamlessness of how more much more realistic it is than the first Pandora film in terms of its ability to be almost the Avatar themselves, the Navi being so believably constructed in those films. So, and I, they're still using human beings, of course, yeah. to wear the mocap suits and all of that, but it's still there. And so you've got a section that enjoys the dumb fun and then a section that I think Venn Diagram does cross over into a big section of the dumb fun that also enjoys these films that might have a little bit more to say. So it's a fascinating thing to explore why certain films are just going to make hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars and have really nothing to say or billions of dollars and have nothing to say. Yet these other films that have a little bit of a better message may not necessarily get to that level. But then other films that have that a better message but have that incredible technology, it kind of finds a way to make its uh, its two billion dollars or whatever. So it's just so interesting. So which is the quality product, right? And that's the thing. That's a separate conversation than which is the most mass consumed product. Which product won? So it's very interesting to look at it from your friend's point of the business person's right. point of view and see how they see it because it there is a logic to that that makes sense. So, so th this is, you know, obviously we're well past the short as we oh, are. Yeah, anyway, right. so we're at a medium level. Sorry about that. No, no, nothing to be sorry about. And this is a whole other conversation, but what I'll right. say, so first of all, I would say both Avatar and the Transformers films where they are similar is they're both spectacles yeah. is that, is that in terms of having your eyes blown away by seeing something and hearing something that you've never seen before, yeah. they actually both fulfill that and audiences love spectacles. What what I what I would say my point is I don't think I cannot just because I'm obsessed with food I'll compare everything to food sure I, I I don't think that everything on the plate or everything you might eat needs to be judged the same way mm -hmm. is that you're not when you're eating a candy bar you know there's no nutrition there right. when you're going to McDonald's you're going to it for convenience cheap food you know it's not good for you right. when you're eating and so to say like well is that doing as much as some broccoli well no it's not good but people in general. Don't go, I'm just going to eat nothing but broccoli. Even though the documentary that is incredibly information dense and extremely powerful and tells us a lot about our world might be great, most people aren't going to do that all the time. Yeah. You know, you're going to want to have dessert and you're going to want to have some other things. But if you only eat Fox News, you are not having a well-balanced diet. Right. You know, and I'll say too, if you're only listening to MSNBC, your, your diet's a little bit better, but not that much. It's right. like, you know, because they're both trying to do a very specific thing is that, and, and I think, and the problem, of course, is America's getting fatter because we're drawn to the fast food and the candy bars more than we're drawn to the broccoli. And and, and we're drawn to the television and we're drawn exactly. to sound down and we're drawn to, uh, you know, being uh, essentially YouTubed on television where they're, here's, a, here's this program. Then right after that is this program. And then right after that, and they're all talking about the same things in different ways. Yeah. Well, Sports. and it's like sports program you go to espn no political thing there espn same thing they're talking about the same shit 24 7 yep. just on different shows well and they're trying to keep on the sports programs as well rivalries going anger going like they're yeah, trying to yes. keep that emotional involvement because that's what's going to keep you there what is the where is the drama and and the thing too is like i know i'm assuming you watched uh all the oscar movies yeah i watched all the oscar movies there were several movies in there that were fucking hard yeah. you know hard to watch and not that they weren't really good. And I go, most people are not going to watch this movie, you know, because why, you know, it was like Tar is hard. Um, Triangle of Sadness. Triangle of Sadness, man. That is a hard movie. Yeah. I think it's a good movie, but I don't know that I'll ever want to watch it again. No, thanks. Yeah. I mean, so, so it's like, and is there a lot to reckon with in those movies? Yeah. Right. But sometimes you'd rather go, you know, watch the latest episode of Ted Lasso or something, which is, right. which has some, I mean, Ted Lasso is great. Yeah. But, but anyway, I mean, it's like the, the, I think we've got, we've gone way, way far away from AI, but I will try to bring it back. In the I think it's still connected, but yes. Go yeah. Well, that's what, and maybe this is what you're thinking too, is that yeah. AI's purpose is to give you what you want, but what we right. want isn't necessarily good for us. <laughs> Yes, yes, which is what so many people rebel against as human beings. They're like, no, you can't tell me what I want. You can't tell me what I need. You can't monitor me. You can't show me. But I actually think we do need that. And I don't mean like Gestapo type of thing. I just mean like there needs to be 
parameters and and uh, barriers and not that we need to be controlled or kept in a pen it's more a matter of like we need to be kept from ourselves at times that the dangers that we can fall into um in as adults because a lot of people when they become adults really go buck wild because they're like yeah i have no parents now nobody can tell me what to do i'm gonna go do all these things and explore all this kind of shit and and it doesn't always lead to the best results and so i think the same thing with this kind of thing with ai there have to be some parameters and barriers and really strong walls to keep people from going into certain areas or being able to access certain areas. Like people talk about the legendary dark web and stuff. So I, I think that's where it, it, what if the AI could be used to do that, to be much more restrictive of what you're able to access, but then who decides what's restrictive? That's the thing. There's that's, that's why I feel like it's a conundrum that never oh, yeah. ends because there is no one who will really actually, or a group of people who will step forward and if they is, there's going to be a lot of people on the one side or the other that's going to be upset about the people chosen to be the group of people to decide what we can and can't have access to. Well, and I'll give you a, a, a very uh, personal a personal quandary for, mm. for me, which is that I really am unhappy about this idea of AI taking away a bunch of jobs from artists yeah. and people that are my friends. Yeah. And one of them is voiceover. Is yes. that you are a voiceover right. artist, right? Yeah. And the AI voices are getting better and better and better. And while I I do still don't believe they will ever be as good as the greatest voiceover artists of all time, I do believe they will be as good as an okay voiceover artist. Yeah. And so you, my friend, who does voiceover, like that's terrible, and I don't think that should happen. And then someone said, "Well, you know, Audible is looking that there are all these books that aren't quite worth hiring someone to do, and there are all these books that I aren't on Audible that I really want to read. Like right. there's the Colleen McCullough First Man in Rome that are all abridged versions on Audible, and these are like forty hour books. And I'm like, I want to listen to all these books. And then my brain went, Well, shit, if there was an AI one, then maybe I could, you know." <laughs> And so that's what I mean is like, right. I don't want them to take your job away. Right. But if they could get me the thing that I want. That's the thing. At the end of the day, it takes advantage of the human's desire. Exactly. To have what it wants or to get what it wants. And like, yeah, exactly. And they'll feel guilt. Like, let me just say this. Uh, how can I say this correctly? A friend recently purchased a thing that will put money in the pocket of a person who is anti-trans and that person i was shocked bought the thing but then that person reasoned it by saying well if your only protest is not buying this thing you're not really that big of an ally and so that so confused me that the one person who i think would most not want to buy the thing that would help an anti-trans activist or anti-trans person did because they wanted to play that thing. They wanted to go into that world and enjoy it. I'm trying to be as vague as possible, but I'm certainly going to read through it. But let's, that's the thing. And so it surprised me. And then I said to and then I said, well, what is it that I'm doing that maybe I'm not aware of that is supporting something simply because I want to do it or I want to watch it or I want to have it or I want to get access to it? I don't know. So well, those are those things that we make these little compromises with ourselves. We make big stands, but then we make little compromises with ourselves when it's something that actually affects us personally. And that's always been the stuff I've struggled with uh, in my so, life. So yeah. I, I here, here's, here's how I reconcile myself. And it's a, and I will say it's a process, mm -hmm. which is that first of all, we are all corrupt. Yes. I mean, that's like hundred percent. I mean, just I'm talking to you on my Apple computer and we're talking about my iPhone and these computers are made by people who are not paid very well. And and, right. and almost everything in our world is there's a very good chance it was made in a situation that isn't yeah. the best situation. Yeah. You know, I what what I think is that, like I said, this is how I reconcile myself to it. Yeah. One, you do what you can do. And two, you try to do better in the future. So yeah. that you go like, so I wasn't, you know, LA didn't have a good composting system. Now they do. So right. now I'm composting. I wasn't composting before, you yeah. know, like is that, and so you go like, okay, what next year, how am I going to be better next year? <laughs> but we, but going like, I'm not, I'm never going to buy anything that contributes to see, you know, like, yeah. am I saying, I, you know, Chick-fil-A supports uh, right. lots of anti-gay stuff. Am I saying I'm never going to have a delicious chicken sandwich? No, I'm not saying that. Will yeah. I try to support local businesses and things like that? Yes, I try to do that. And then you go, well, and let's see if I can do a little bit better. Let's yeah. see if I can do a little better next time. That's my way of looking at it. 
Yeah. Yeah. So this has been our exhaustive conversation yeah. about AI. I'm really surprised we went almost 50 minutes on this. Uh, I, I, I literally just thought it'd be like a 20 minute short, but we certainly had a lot to say about it. Um, we hope you enjoyed our conversation. This is uh, not even a, a medium. This is a longie. So <laughs> we, we hope you enjoyed this conversation uh, on, uh, on the Cinephiles quote unquote shorts here. Uh, we appreciate it madly. We love all of you who support us uh, here on the Cinephiles. Thank you so much. And I hope you all have received the emails that I've been sending over the last few weeks uh, representing Steve and I asking about what would inspire you all to jump up to higher levels in your support. Cause Steve and I have a lot of plans for where we want the show to go next. And hopefully you all are considering that and looking at that responding back. We've really enjoyed a lot of your responses but also really, even if you haven't responded, considering making the jump to a higher tier so that you can keep supporting what we do here on the uh, on the uh, Cinephiles for sure. So for my partner, Steve Morris, uh, I am still the human being, John Roca, and we thank you very much for uh, listening to this Cinephile short, and we'll talk to you next time. Hello and welcome to the very first Cinephile short, Fuck, Mary Kill edition. <laughs> My name is Steve Morris here with my partner, the outlaw John Roca. We might have kids listening, Steve. Should we say F Mary Kill? Is that wait, wait, we're gonna stop swearing on the cinephiles? (laughs) I just well, (laughs) we've been swearing for seven straight years, John. That's true. true. I get nervous. I'm too old to clean up my act. (laughs) That's fair. I mean, I've just seen some teachers reach out to us and say that they're playing our episodes for their children in their classes. So I've been kind of weird about that lately. But yes, let's do it. Uh, Fuck, Mary kill. Um, And this was to give credit to Steve. Steve came up with this idea of like, wouldn't it be fun to kind of play this? Oh, was it me? I don't remember. No, this was it. This is a perfect cinephiles team effort. Yes. Because I had the idea of like, you know, it'd be fun for short sometimes to do some kind of a speed round thing. And I, but I, and I said, but I don't quite know how we would do it. And then you said, uh, fuck, Mary kill is what we should do. And I was like, absolutely. That is exactly what. And so I, John have come up with one for you. Okay. And it is based on our last short, which is our last short was on the horrors of AI. Yes. And so the three movies that you get to choose between are Terminator two, the Matrix and 2001 A Space Odyssey. Wow. So this might surprise you, but it's a very fast response for me. Okay. Um, it'll be a very short short. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, how shout out to the people who are responding to our short on AI. A lot of people are yeah. really kind of chiming in about that, huh? We, well, we... including including a chat bot. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because someone actually had, had got dialogue for Steve and John discussing Battlefield Earth. I think it was uh, Charles uh, Charles Test Test Drake did that. Yeah. It was really funny, Charles. That was hilarious. A, a, show, a, a film we'll never cover on the cinema. I have never seen it. Really? Ooh. Ooh. I was that was during my Travolta kick, and I was like, oh man, really? So, but could be fun if we ever create like an uh, an anti cinephile show, the anti files or the ex <laughs> ex cinephiles or whatever, and we would just like watch terrible movies and talk about them for like an hour. I I can only do that rarely. Yeah, <laughs> <It's> a, <laughs> once a year, maybe. But I'm happy to bash something every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> um. So here's what I would say. As I understand the FMK game, the fuck, marry, kill game is like you kill one of these. So they never exist again. You marry one of them and then you fuck another one. Uh, so I would absolutely kill Terminator 2. Uh, fuck the Matrix because the Matrix would be an awesome sex experience. Uh, but I would marry 2001 because it's so epic. It is going to last forever. It's a long movie and it is still influencing films today. So to me, I imagine I will have a much greater or better time being married to 2001 uh, because it's such a classic film than I would Terminator 2 or um, The Matrix. Uh, so that's my answer to that. What, what would be your answer to these three? I, I, I am concerned you will probably be very disappointed in my answer, <laughs> but I will tell you what it is, which is that for me, for just pure fun, 
yeah, you can't beat Terminator 2. So that's that's the fuck. It's like, you know, because I put it on any time, watch any little sequence. It could last a long time. It could last a short time. <laughs> and I would totally enjoy that. For ideas and excitement, I'm marrying The Matrix because wow. there's so much in there. I love the whole movie top to bottom. And so, yes, John, I am killing 2001 A Space Odyssey. Wow. Wow. You, you're, I, you are disappointed in me, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, because I feel like, could you really hit, I mean, the dominatrix of it all and the leather and all of that? Is that something that... Well, that's spicing really? up my marriage because okay. I have that and I have great fight scenes, but I also have deep ideas. You know, like Terminator 2 has no deep ideas, which is why I don't really want to marry it. I just want to right. fool around with it. That's why I want to kill it, but okay. Yeah. All right, fair um, and 2001, and the thing is, to marry, that means this is what you're living with. Right. Like, forever. And I don't want to live in the world of 2001 and the HAL 9000. And, yeah. like, it's it's a very upsetting. So, I, as much as I, it's an amazing movie, it's one of the great films of all time, yeah. I'm neither marrying it nor having sex with it. All right. Fair enough. Well, all right. Let's move on to this. Uh, all right. I'm ready. I'm going to throw some out there. So, I'm going to rip through the trilogies and see. All right, original Star Wars trilogy, fuck Mary Kill. What are your thoughts on those three? Again, it instantly is I'm killing Jedi, I'm marrying Empire Strikes Back, and I'm I'm fucking Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, see, I'm I'm diff- I, I'm a little bit different in that I absolutely do kill Jedi, but I have sex with Empire Strikes Back. I fuck Empire Strikes Back, but I marry Star Wars because that's the foundational piece. Sure. And so uh, to me, I see that as something that I'm going to be with for a long time and constantly rediscover how much I'm enjoying it. But Empire Strikes Back, that's a fuck movie for sure, man. You're riding a, a crazy horse on that one, and it's going to be a blast for sure. Um, all right, let's. Uh, all right, now, what about the Godfather trilogy? Which one are, uh, what's the fuck, Mary uh, Kill on the Godfather? Well, again, the kill is easy because I'm kill is God- easy. Godfather three. Okay. Oh, shit. Um, uh- <laughs> Um, I guess, I mean, it's just, I, I, it's a really impossible one because I'm like, well, I certainly am not marrying Godfather 2. I guess that's the way I have to answer it is like, because that world is so dark and so painful. It's a great movie. Yeah, yeah. So I guess I fuck Godfather 2 and marry Godfather 1. I don't know. What do you, what do you think? I, I think I would have to marry Godfather 1 because, again, it's the foundational piece of the trilogy it is the foundation so that will last forever and i like the way it ends it's a much more satisfying ending whereas the ending of godfather 2 is so depressing i will have a colossally insane fuck experience with godfather 2 but in the end i'm gonna have to break up with godfather 2 because it's so depressing it's it's so rough it's dramatic you know all right i got one for you okay it's this is an odd combo, but let's see let's see where it goes. Let's dance. Your choices are yeah. Star Trek II: The Wrath of Khan, <sighs> Star Trek two thousand nine, and Galaxy Quest. Oh wow! Oh wow! Um. Oh wow! Uh, I would say Star Trek. I have to I have to marry Wrath of Khan. There is yeah. no question that, Same. that that will just be endlessly enjoyable for the rest of my life. That'll be the happiest marriage I could ever wish upon myself. I have to kill I have to have sex with Galaxy Quest. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. That's one of those giggling fun uh people that you have sex with and just enjoy it constantly because it's always making you smile or laugh or it's just great you, you can't really see the future with this person but you both understand that and so you can let go and enjoy the relationship for what it is and you'll stay friends afterwards um but with this but i would kill star trek 2009 i don't need it if i've got wrath of Khan. i don't need it if i've got wrath of Khan. so obviously so obviously wrath of Khan, mary that that was just yeah. not even a question 
going to see Star Trek 2009 was one of the great movie going experiences ever. So at opening yeah. night, I remember particularly the opening sequence when Jim Kirk is born, I was yeah. bawling. And at the end of it, I was so thrilled and so excited because I, particularly the casting more than anything else. Like, it's like they got it. There's Star, Star Trek is back. I was so fucking excited. I don't think that movie has aged as well. Not that it's, I mean, I really like it, but yeah. I don't think it's aged as well. I think Galaxy Quest is so special yeah. and so much fun. My, it's not, And this is not a diss on Star Trek 2009. I just yeah. don't like the movie. Yeah. But uh, yeah, my answer is the same as yours. I'm killing 2009 and fucking Galaxy Quest. There you go. All right, I've got three for you. Okay. Lawrence of Arabia. Oh, God. Seven Samurai. Mm-hmm. And Citizen Kane. <laughs> You're a goddamn bastard. Is what you are. <laughs> and I, this one is. A, I came up with that one while I was taking a piss before the show. I was like, I've got. If I give him Lawrence of Arabia, I gotta pick one that will kind of strike Steve hard in the heart if he was to kill it. Seven Samurai. Yes. And what's one that we've talked about that we both love? Kane. Perfect. Which I watched an hour of. Last night on the TCM yeah. app on my television, just for shits and giggles. Well, first of all, I, I genuinely this is impossible, but I will give an answer because I have to give an answer. Right. Um, and oh, oh, oh. I, I'm real. I'm really struggling. And and what I'm gonna say, I'm gonna marry Citizen Kane. And 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 because there's just so much there. I mean, there's just like you could literally can you literally can spend the rest of your life with that movie, you know. You could look at that movie every single day, I like want, you would have to look at your wife, and it, and you would see, and it would be beautiful, and you would see new things. It would be exciting and thrilling every day. So I'm marrying that. Okay. God damn it! Are you gonna make me kill Seven Samurai? Uh, uh, that are I, you? I think that's what I gotta do. I gotta kill wow. Seven Samurai, and I mean, but it's like, I mean, you're literally this is literally Sophie's choice. Like <laughs> you're, you're taking what I've always said is my favorite movie of all time, which is Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah. You sit as a game, which is the greatest movie of all time. And then it's fucking Seven Samurai, which is in the top five greatest movies of all time. And so, but I guess that's what I got to do. What's your answer? Wow. Um, yeah, it's a good question. What is my answer? I, <laughs> I, you think, started this. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I think I would have to marry Seven Samurai because I just love that movie so much. And it's a three hour epic. And it really, you know, me, I love those underdog films, the little guy against the big, against the evil thing. So I love it. I think I would have to fuck Citizen Kane because of the fact that it's the greatest film ever made, period. So it would be endlessly enjoyable and different every yeah. single time I had sex with uh, Citizen Kane. So that, and even last night, I was texting you last night. Yeah. Text, uh, just reveal. Last night I was texting Steve as I was watching it because I was like, wait, we never get to see his reaction to the death of his wife, his first wife and his son that's never talked about. There's no trauma talked about it. There's nothing that's really ever referred to in all of this. And I, I wonder why we never saw that. And of course, I always default back to the fact that all of this is told by the memories of everyone else. Kane actually never gets to tell his own nope. story. And so... Wouldn't it be fascinating? And for the first time ever, I texted Stephen and said, I think I might be open for a remake for Citizen Kane if it's a series Shock like we've it's seen. a shocking statement from you, yeah. but actually I'm totally with you. I like the yeah. idea. Yeah, if we found the right creators to come in and redo it and flesh out the story of all the characters, there could be some really incredible stuff with Bernstein, with Leland, with, uh, with uh, uh, like I said, his, his first wife, with all of that stuff. There could be a lot explored. Kane's exploits overseas, his meeting with Hitler. Like, yeah. there's so much you could explore just from the opening news on the march that would right. be scenes for days in a series. So. Yeah, but I would have to kill Lawrence of Arabia, sadly. And I and I love that movie. Love yeah. that movie. But, you know, it is a long-ass movie, so I, mean, I just have to kill it because those other two kind of fill that void for me. So, yeah, that's where I would be on that one. All right. Well, clearly, since you have a cruel streak, <laughs> oh, no. I will, I will okay. give you the following options. Okay. West Side Story, 1961. Oof. West Side Story, 2021. And an American in Paris. Oh my God. Oh shit. 
But this is gonna. Oh. Have to, I think this is gonna be a regular short. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna have to be like every couple of months. We're gonna have yeah. to visit this. <laughs> and for those of you who are patrons of ours and you've listened to numerous episodes, you suge- you all suggested yeah. some FMKs would be fantastic as well. Um, and make sure that you know you're using the knowledge of the films that we've talked about. For those of you who are much more knowledgeable patrons, it could make it a much more interesting short for us for sure. Um. I think I would ha- I would have to marry 1961's West Side Story. I just would have to because of uh, just the classic nature of it all. And that's the film that, like, for me as a young Latino kid, it was like, yes, seeing us on screen like this in the way. In the, and I know not all of, obviously not all the actors were Latino, but it was the representation that I thought was great. Um, uh, yeah, I would have to have sex with American in Paris. I love American in Paris. I love American. No, you do. It's on the a- a TCA map. I almost flipped over after Kane and watched just some of the musical numbers there. That is, I know everyone says singing, singing in the rain is the best musical ever made, but to me, artistically, American in Paris is a better musical. I who it is the 16 minute ballet. Who the fuck gets away with that? It's incredible that film. It is legitimately the definition of classic. Um, so I would have to go, but I and I'd have to kill 2021's West Side Story simply because of the uh, Ansel Elgort situation and the sexual sexual stuff that was involved there and the accusations. So it makes it easier for me to kill it because I because I don't think he's the best Tony uh, as opposed to what we got in um, in the first uh, West Side Story. So that's that's my answer, which was not. So easy. It, I mean, it's a it's a horrible one to have to answer. Yeah. And and my it, I. My first thought was like, well, I don't actually need two West Side Stories. Okay. You know, and so I guess I got, have to kill one of the West Side Stories. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm killing 1961. Wow. Because, But it'll be interesting because I, I said when we did our review of West Side Story with David and Milena, yeah. I actually think Spielberg, my feeling at that time was Sp- Steven Spielberg's West Side Story might be the greatest movie musical ever made. Mm-hmm. Now, cool. it'll be interesting to revisit this in a decade and yeah, say, yeah. okay, now I've had some time and how do I, you know, over the initial reaction yeah. and how do I feel about it? But at this moment, I'm keeping that and, you know, and then I have this, I mean, who's, who's, who do you want to have sex with? I'm a straight man, but Gene Kelly dancing, <laughs> there's few things more amazing than that. So I think American in Paris for, for the fuck is a, is a good one. Well, I mean, Leslie Caron is quite beautiful in that movie. She, hey, well. look, but look, we're we're, we're all going to have a great time. <laughs> <laughs> we're all gonna, it'll be a throuple. We're all going to have a great time for sure. <laughs> um, is there a goofy one we can do? How about Adam Sandler? A uh, fuck, Mary kill, um, Big Daddy. I've never seen it. Oh no! So you, you're not. Uh, I'm not a huge Adam Sandler yeah. person. So is there I, a comedian I, that you like? Oh, fuck, Mary kill. How about Coming to America? Hmm. Trading places and Beverly Hills Cop. It's you're you're you will not like my answer, but I bet my guess is our answers will be the opposite. Okay, okay. Because I'm killing coming to America. Oh my god. I'm marrying wow. Beverly Hills Cop and fucking trading places. Wow. Would 48 yeah. hours have changed this lineup in any way, shape, or form? Uh it depends on which it replaced. Okay. If it replaced yeah. trading places, would it change anything? Yeah, then I would probably kill 48 hours. Okay, so it yeah. keeps oh, right, fair enough. It, ke- it keeps coming to, to America alive. Gotcha. Yeah. No, I would totally marry coming to America. Yeah, I figured. I'd have to kill Trading Places, I think. Ah. And have sex with Beverly Hills Cop. Yeah. I haven't seen Trading Places in forever. Mm. I love that movie and watched it a ton yeah. in the 80s. And I'm kind of curious yeah. how it would hold how I would feel about it today. <laughs> What, what, I, what I was trying to think of, but I haven't come up with a good one, is yeah. actually three bad movies and that you have to marry one of them and which oh, one are you going to live with is great. to go the opposite direction. Um, and that's why when you said Adam Sandler, that would be like the, the kind of thing to do. Yeah. Or like, you know, we, we were talking about like Battlefield Earth came up and it's like, well, what if we pick, you know, Battlefield Earth, look who's talking to and... <laughs> um, Worst of Travolta. Yeah, uh, what's the, what's another one? Well, uh, the one he did from Paris or whatever uh, uh, that he did with Jonathan Rhys Meyers. That's pretty fucking. Oh, Broken Arrow is oh, pretty Broken Arrow. Oh, Oof, oh. that's a terrible movie, man. So I have not seen Battlefield Earth, but <laughs> so, but I would still kill it sight unseen yeah. from everything I've heard about it. 
And uh, I would fuck Broken Arrow. And <laughs> no, then I'm married to Look Who's Talking To. That just seems like a terrible plan. I, I would marry Look Who's Talking To because at least I still get Kirstie Alley. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm kind of good with that. Yeah. Um, so this has been our very first edition of FMK Cinephile yeah. Shorts. It was a lot of fun. If you guys have some suggestions or would like to have us do this again, we certainly can. And of course, thank you all of you for your support. We absolutely could not make the Cinephiles without you. And for my partner, John Roca, I'm Steve Morris, and we'll see you on another Cinephile Short. Cinephile Short.